<laughs> Welcome everyone in person and online. We have a great panel for this evening. Um, because it's an organizational meeting and we have not appointed a chair and vice chair, I get, get the opportunity to um, open the meeting. We have two new board members. I want to welcome Heather Valor, who has vast experience with our district, and representing for Barnard on a three year um, <laughs> term, and Tony Fernandez, who is from Woodstock, again for a three year term. Um, returning to us, Ryan Townsend hasn't made it in yet from um, Bridgewater, Katie Reed for three years and welcome back. <clears throat> from Killington, Bob Crean, who just can't leave us, which we're really excited. Bob, we're not going to tell you how many years we go way back. Where's your best chat, Bob? I yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> and welcome back, Harry Briscoe, and representing from, uh, from Woodstock. Um, and so those are the new and turning positions of this year. So just wanted to thank everyone for coming in. So the purpose of... Um, this opening uh, meeting is to elect the board officers for the MVSU as the boards. The elected, uh, the elected will hold the same position on both boards. A board chair and board clerk are legally required. A vice chair is best practice, but not legally required. Um, I will open for nominations for board chair. Uh, if board members are interested, you can call out a nomination. Huh? Oh, you can. So, yeah, but no, I'm just put it. So if you don't hear it, because I have my plug in. For chair, do we have a second? I would say. Let's, anyone else? Any other nominations for board chair? Seeing none, moving their names forward. Can we take a vote? Um, asking people to vote on the motion for uh, Carrie Bristow as board chair. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Uh, that's okay. I'll just go in here. I'm not going to stay on it long. Can, okay. can Barbara uh, mute? Okay. We have some people who have freaking mute. Bless your board member. Thanks. Okay. Sam. Uh, Sam. Uh, Sam. All right. So, Carrie, I pass the gauntlet back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for electing me as the chair for another year. Uh, And um, at this time, we need to elect a vice chair. We do elect to do that on our board. Is there a nomination for vice chair? I nominate Ben for you. I will second that. Any other names to put forward? All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, well, thank you, Ben, for all the hard work you've already done. <laughs> all right, and also, uh, we usually uh, elect a clerk. Uh, Matt Stout has been our clerk. Is there a nomination for clerk? I would like to nominate someone other than myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's rather, who are you pointing to? John, I'd like to nominate you as clerk. <laughs> and and the three, next time wait. Yeah. <laughs> but it, Ray, Ray, I mean Raymond does all the work for the board, but it's just when we go to executive session, just to take notes when we go in, when we go out. It's very straightforward. Second. <laughs> Any other nominations for clerk? No, no discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of, of uh, electing John Williams as clerk, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, John, for being willing to do this job. <laughs> okay. Um, at this time, we are going to discuss reorganizing our committees and working groups. I thought it would be useful for everybody to um, each chair of a board, um, a committee or a working group would say briefly what the work of their board is. And I do have some requests from some folks who asked to move from one uh, to another, which we can talk about at the end. And other people who may want to change have the right to, to bring that forward tonight. And then it would be my job to finalize that. 
Right. So why don't we start with, hang on, uh, Sherry's going to pull up the uh, chair. There it is. Hang on, but I have to change the shirt on the Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Ron. Oh. All right. Um, Brian, you're the chair now. All right, finance committee. <laughs> finance committee, please tell us briefly what the work is and what the commitment of time is. Sure. Um, finance committee um, is uh, obviously responsible for putting together the, the annual budget. Uh, we get the pleasure of, of working closely with the business operations manager, Jim Fenn, um, and also uh, Sherry Souza and a lot of our meetings. But um, the um, it, things that may come along outside of the, the regular budget cycle and require an opinion on you know, the uh, expenditure of the school district. But uh, the big job is the annual budget. Um, and you're looking for a time commitment? Yeah, how often do you meet? Yeah, well, it's like other committees, we meet uh, once a month. Uh, on the opposite uh, cadence of the, the board meeting. And then if there's something that comes along that uh, requires more media attention, we'll do an ad hoc meeting. But um, let's say the time commitment is probably, you know, less than five hours a month. Okay. Is that fair for other audience committee members? Yes. Depends on the season, right? Right. Send us all the work. We'll just show up so we can vote. <laughs> Discuss too, I think. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ben. Um, policy? Yep, um, Elliot Rubin. So the policy committee is charged with uh, working through all the existing policies, making sure they're all up to date. And we had a mandate from the uh, Vermont uh, School Board Association to do that. We're in the process of it. So and policies are really the structure, the important structure that the whole organization is based on. So it's pretty important to keep them sort of relevant. We do come up with new ones uh, when it's needed. We're working on one that's involving athletics and activities right now, which we've been working on for about a year. Um, and uh, the time commitment is basically, um, you know, we meet every month. And it's about an hour, hour and a half when we meet. In between time, we try to each take a, a policy and work on it. Um, we sometimes have to do a little homework in terms of getting another input from it. So we certainly would welcome anybody who would like to continue or other people to work on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, buildings and grounds. Um, sure. So I chair buildings and grounds currently. Um, we definitely could use uh, some new members. We lost Bryce, who, who just came off the board. Um, so we, um, it, it's a, I should make it clear that we um, are mostly responsible for the maintenance of all the buildings and, and prioritizing the projects that need to get done. And about, what, five, six years ago, we created a second committee for the new build. So our committee is not primarily focused on the new build but we're focused on how do we maintain the current facilities. And that, that is um, really seven different properties, Reading, West, Barnard, Killington, Prosper Valley School, Middle School, High School, and this building. Um, <clears throat> we meet monthly like all the other committees. There's not much of a time commitment outside of those meetings. Um, but one of the main things we try to accomplish before budgeting season is, is selecting the priority of uh, a priority list of projects that will go into the budget. Um, and, and then we respond to any uh, proposals that come into RFPs. So we, we will evaluate the different bids that come in and pick a winner. Um, and generally just um, sort of scope and evaluate any capital projects or any large investments in our, in our buildings and grounds. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, the working group, the HSMS working group. Well, that is the new build, and um, the um, um, mandate or the the orders kind of given by the board uh, some years ago were to um, kind of um, kindly do the needful to bring about a new building. We uh, we came pretty close just recently um, in terms of the funding, but um, yeah, um, it's a mixture. I think. Working groups are interesting because they're a mixture of board members and community members, right? And so you can see some of the, the names here. You've got a lot of 
folks from the administration and the, and the uh, teachers on there and other community members. Um, but uh, yeah, that's um, that one is is uh, constantly evolving. I think that's one that we'll you know see a lot of uh, activity over the next um, by the next uh, school year or the next uh, year of the board's activities. But um, I don't know what else is to say about the new board committee. Time commitment. Um, not okay. much. I'll with them. <laughs> not much. <laughs> Eighty hours a week. <laughs> Um, no, it's interesting. I mean, certainly this last year and getting all the steps, you know, bringing on the construction manager, bringing on the owner's representative, you know, there were, there was, you know, quite a bit. And then the, gosh, the, um, the value engineering sessions, those kinds of things that got a little bit intense, but that was just a subset of that committee. Um, and we pieced it up for various functions. So I don't know, I'd say for any particular, um, committee member, even at the height of it, I wouldn't think it'd be more than um, 10 hours a month for that activity. Okay, thank you. Um, configuration and enrollment group. Uh, Marianne has um, gone off the board, so that we would need a new chair. Um, that group kind of meets on demand when there is a need to look at enrollment trends and or configuration of buildings and things like that. It was a, a, an intense time a couple of years ago when we were reconfiguring Prosper Valley as a separate school for grades five and six. Um, there have not been as many meetings recently. Um, discussion of the mascot along with the student group has been one of the topics. So uh, that, that does not necessarily meet every month. It meets when it's needed to meet. So it's hard to say what the time convention is. Um, or, or do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, that's that's accurate. I think there it ebbs and flows. Like some some months we're probably meeting twice a month, and then some months we go without a meeting. So it depends on the project. Right. I would say the at least for me the months where we're committing more time, it's it's good work. And yeah. The group gets along really well. Um, I'm always excited about progress, so I'm excited to hear more about the mascot and. What the students want us to do with that um but it's always been a, a, an enjoyable group to work with mm -hmm. uh the communication working group i think sam can speak to that um the communication working group we don't really meet very often um uh i kind of ended up as chair just by default as being one of the people who uh was still it on it from past times um i would love for somebody else to take charge of chairing it um or um i'm happy i can chair it as long as i'm also not on policy at the same time um which is what i am currently um doing both so um yeah if somebody has a passion for communication and um getting out uh information to um, the community and would really like to take helm <laughs> of communication. I'm happy to give over the, the reins. Um, as of right now, what it mostly consists of is um, having different postings and other communications or letters like the recent letter that we put out on Friday or that Carrie and Ben put together and sent over to, and I just, you know, put it on all the listservs, front porch forum, numerous Facebook groups. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. But um, there's definitely room, room for growth if somebody else would love to take charge of it. All right, thank you. Uh, the negotiations working group is down to one member, which is myself. <laughs> um, and I actually have a couple of people who have shown interest in that. So I'm pleased to say that that is also a group that works when it's needed to work. Um, we hope to wrap up a three year uh, contract with the with the teachers um, soon. And the support staff has a three year contract that's in its second year now. So that's a group that probably won't have a lot of activity except when um, a question comes up about the contract that needs to be interpreted. So it it's again, it can be time intensive in the in the negotiating year, but it's um, 
usually hour, a couple, couple hours of a meeting when it's needed. And the fundraising working group. I think that's more of a community group at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they, they, I don't even see if there's anybody from the board on that group currently. Um, and I, I know they worked on projects and do a lot of publicity for projects. And I think that's it. So I did put out um, an email to the board members, except for Heather and Ernie, because they weren't yet um, sworn in and asked about changes. And I have the following changes to propose, um, which I believe we do need to vote on these, but there may be more. So would somebody uh, put a motion to discuss uh, changes to committees and working groups? Second. Okay, thank you. Um, so Ryan Townsend has asked to be moved to negotiations. And my question, Ryan, is did you want to stay? Where is Ryan? Oh, there he is. <laughs> did you want to stay on the other group that you're currently in, which I believe is finance? Uh, I'm currently in the new bill group, um, which I didn't participate once in this past year. So I apologize for that. But thanks for leaving me on the website for it. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I'm happy to help with that, but I'd actually like to try to join building and maintenance, um, or if that is a possibility, um, more building and grounds. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, but again, I don't want to leave you guys short handed. If you need people, I'm happy to help Ben or the group, but, uh, yeah, I've been pretty useless on that for the past year. So, so you would move off of the. A, uh, HSMS build group and on to buildings and grounds. Yeah, if possible, yes, please. Okay. And John um, Williams and I discussed um, him moving on to the negotiations, but remaining on the, the build group, mm -hmm. correct? That's right. And Josh, you would like to be moved to the new build group. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were on the communication. Do you want to stay on that? I can stay on that. Okay. That one doesn't really take a lot of commitment, so it's just kind of one needed. Okay, <clears throat> great. And Corinne um, has asked to go to finance from policy, so she would move to finance and drop off of policy. Um, I know that buildings and grounds need some members, and um, looks like Ryan will fill one of those roles. Um, are there other board members who would request a change of what they're currently doing? I would like to not be on both communication and policy. I can do one or the other. Okay. Or or <laughs> if I'm I can stay on communication if it's as like a working group and it's just as needed. Um, but I don't want to uh, be like responsible for like chairing and like setting meetings or anything like that. Like I'll I'll be on the working group, um, as long as I don't have to like be the the chair of communications and responsible for making the like setting the meetings and everything like that. Okay, so well, why don't we for now leave you where you are, and then if it becomes too much. We can make a shift. Is that all right with you, Sam? Yeah, as long as there's just somebody else who's the main. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I have a question just to clarify because on here we don't have it, but Ann Carl has been on our uh, policy committee. And okay. I just wanted to clarify if she is or will remain or not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Would love to stay where I am. So hopefully that works. Okay. So Anne will get added officially. Okay, yeah. She didn't, you didn't have her on here, but good. Thank you. Yeah, Gary, I'm happy to help Sam and be a co-chair and do the, you know, the admin stuff to help her out. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Great. Love that. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else who would like to change something? All right, so then if there's no other changes, we'll leave those who are already on a standing 
committee are working with as they are. And Marina, were you able to get all those changes? All right. Um, I'm going to call a vote. Are we all in favor of the changes that were made? Please say aye. Uh, these two, did you oh, want to join us? Ernie, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Heather and Ernie. I, I talked sorry, to both, <laughs> both of them. And there's no, you don't have to go on a committee or a working group, no pressure. But if there's an interest you, that you have, this would be a great time to tell us. So um, I would be interested in either communication or policy. Okay. How's the policy looking there? It would be great to have. Yeah, that would be great. Great. All right. So, Heather Law would move on to policy and Ernie. My interest is in finance, and I'm also able to uh, to help with the fundraising working group if the members of that group are looking for uh, additional outside participation. Okay. Do you want your name officially on both of those groups? Um, I'd like my name officially on finance, and I'm ready to be officially on the fundraising working group after the current members are consulted. Okay. Very good. All right. Eager and diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in with both feet. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Straight to the defense. <laughs> All right, just going to make a note here for myself. We might have had a change. Last one. Yeah, if all these people are joining finance, I can switch over to buildings and grounds. It sounds like we need more people. Okay. Lara will move to buildings and grounds. Excellent. Look. <laughs> Do yes. that, does that leave you with anybody yes. besides yourself with negotiations? Uh, John Williams is going to come yeah. on negotiations. Oh, okay. I missed that. Okay, great. Yeah. Possible. And myself. Uh, yeah, for oh, you negotiations. Wanna, and, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Ryan. I was thinking that, maybe. Change. Change. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so Ryan will also go on negotiations. Okay. Great. Great. Awesome. Okay. I just wanted to thank Corinne for all her contributions and hard work on the committee. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elliot. I, I'm happy to just also, you know, continue out with Perfect. the whole athletic <laughs> thing too, as, as needed. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Are we ready to vote? All in favor of the slate that we just put together, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you all. Looks like a great, great rearrangement. Okay, um, at this time, I think we're going to discuss the code of ethics. If you have the paper copy, it's in there. Right, that comes up now. Which side? Okay. So normally we sign a paper and in this day of saving paper, I thought perhaps we could just take a quick look at this again. If you haven't seen it yet, take a look through it. Um, in the past, we've had um, everyone participated um, in signing it, but I thought perhaps we could just do an affirmation, which would be raising our hands and saying we agree to it. Is that all right with everybody? All right, I'll give you a couple minutes to review it. I have a question for reviewing it. Um, I know there's a, a couple of us here that have um, either um, parents or friends or partners that work for the district. Can you, my husband being one of them, can you clarify what I think outside of negotiating for teachers for supplementary supporting staff, I can't vote, but is there anything else I need to be cognizant of to step out of? I would say anytime you know his name is raised, you would excuse yourself for an, another reason. Oh, I can't think of what that might be, but okay. I think when it when when he first took the position, it was mainly around support staff. I think it's food okay. services, contracting or support staff. I'm gonna look at Raina. Hi, hi. Thanks. What's the question? Uh, as Matt works for food services, uh, what do I need to defer from voting on or being part of? I think that would be something that you would um, look at as an on uh, by case basis. Okay. Um, my husband was on the board for years, and so if if something would affect you directly financially, then you just refuse yourself. Okay, I'll ask the I guess everybody in the room that if there's something that you feel like I need to step off of, please make me aware. The, the two you. things I would think about would be. Any issue with a coworker 
Okay. You know, even if it's not between him and the co worker mm -hmm. and anything to do with the support staff union. Okay. Sure. And those are the two key things. If it's another food service worker, it's just best you're not part of it. Right, right. This you is, know, even you. if it's not a conflict, it's probably best you're just not part of it. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. And since Anna's bringing that up, I'll do the same. My wife is the SEL teacher at West. So if you keep me honest, if I need to step out of any folks, let me know. My wife's just my boss, so if I have to. <laughs> it's already public loss. <laughs> we can send the recording the clip to her. <laughs> All right, are there any questions about um, the, the Code of Ethics for Vermont School Board members? All right, hearing none, can uh, we raise our hand and affirm that we will uphold the Code of Ethics to the best of our abilities? Absolutely. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. So, thank you. Rain, we'll put that in the minutes right. should it ever be questioned. Thank you. Um, now we are going to approve the uh, meeting schedule, the posting places, and the newspapers of record. Currently, we post to the Vermont Standard and Mountain Times. And the posting, those are the posting, and the posting places are Town, Hall. Town Halls, uh, the MBSU Bulletin Board website, and the school campuses within the MBSD. Okay, everybody notice, notes that there are two changes when we are not on the second um, Monday because of holidays that get in the way. Uh, so uh, I guess we can do them together. We'll also approve the committee meeting schedule. If that's all right. We do both at the same time. It has the same posting places, the same um, newspapers when necessary. These are also on the website. So if you're ever wondering, there's a great tab for the school board on the website. It has anything to do with our um, minutes, meetings, upcoming meetings, members, the, what we saw here up there, that's on that same tab. It has all that information. All right, um, is there a motion to approve the meeting schedules of both the regular meetings and the committee and working group meetings? I make a motion. Okay, thank you, Josh. Second. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Um, aye. Okay, thank you. And we have to appoint a voting delegate for statewide health insurance. Um, Adam, can you explain the very demanding job that it is? <laughs> He's never been called upon. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they have my email address or phone number. Well, I'm sure Raina sends it to them. <laughs> okay. But in my last year on the board, I will happily serve out this last year doing this role. All right. Can somebody <laughs> um, nominate him, please? I'm nominating. Right. Yeah, it's my last year. Okay. Any other, any other volunteers for this extremely busy position? <laughs> no? Okay. All those in favor of... Uh, pointing Adam as our delegate, please say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? All right, Adam, unanimous. I got it. Can Thank we you. take a vote on whether this is the last year or not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want it. Don't want it. Oh, that's it all. <laughs> all right. We um, need a motion to adjourn. So, second. second. All right, all in favor of adjourning this part of the meeting, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I'm going to call the second meeting to order at 6.59, the monthly meeting. I believe we have a very strong quorum here. Yeah. Thank you all. And I'm going to ask if there are any amendments to the agenda. I have an amendment. I have a resignation letter. Okay. To do that. All right. And I'm going to um, suggest that we put that resignation um, announcement right after we approve the minutes in the in the agenda. Thank you. At this time, we have an opportunity for public comment. 
Um, there's a beginning at the beginning of the meeting, there's a time, and there's also another time at the end. So if you think of something during the meeting, you'll have a second chance to bring that up. We do ask if you're online that you would raise your hand, either digitally or um, with your own hand, um, and state your name and town of residence for the minutes as well. And um, if you're here, sometimes we have a sign-in sheet for those that want to speak. Um, I'm just going to go over the, this once per year, is that any member of the public has can speak if you're speaking want to speak twice on the same topic, we ask you to wait for uh, until all others have had the chance to speak. Uh, we do appreciate order and decorum. Um, and we do not uh, allow any maybe personal, impertinent, threatening, or profane remarks. And um, I think that's enough said about that. So at this time, are there any members of the public who would like to speak? Yes. Uh, my name is Bill McDonald. I live here in town. I'm one of Ben's neighbors up on Linden Hill. Um, I'm probably one of the very few people here tonight who voted against the bond issue. I would like to have voted for it because I'm, uh, I appreciate the value of public education. If we had better schools in the South and Midwest, we wouldn't be threatened with another Trump in uh, four years in our demise of our democracy. But um, uh, one thing I would like to ask the board to consider, and this is very radical, I'll admit that right off the top of my head, rather than spending a hundred plus million dollars on a new school, have we, in all honesty and seriously, considered the possibility of merging with one of the three neighboring school districts, Hartford, um, Lebanon, or or Hanover and sending say uh, 10 through 12th graders to one of those schools using our elementary schools, perhaps the one here in the village or maybe Prosper if the, if the uh, problems out there have been rectified for uh, K through six, seven, eight, whatever uh, is felt is uh, most, most uh, uh, reasonable. Now, this is radical, and a lot of people will be opposed to this immediately. People don't like to lose their local schools. And um, and I, I can appreciate that. I had three boys who went through the system here. Um, but $100 million for a small school system that graduates less than 100 kids a year, and if Killington pulls out, which I guess, from what I read, is possible and maybe even probable. Um, I don't see how the taxpayers are going to be able to survive this. Uh, I'm retired. I, I'm not really living on a completely fixed income. I have my Vanguard portfolio that has been doing pretty well the last 20 years. Uh, so I'm not in crisis financially myself. But when I talk to other people, uh, they're really worried. The, we're already facing what an eighteen percent increase on the state taxes this year. Is that what it is? Eighteen um, percent. I that's what I've heard. So I mean, well, folks probably know more about that than I do. But a um, hundred million dollars. Oh my God. We got to think of something else. And uh, okay, my proposal here is not say I want to do this. I'm only suggesting it as something to. Seriously, and I emphasize the word seriously, um, consider not, not some pro forma thing. Um, so that's uh, those are the thoughts that have been my, on my mind. I'm sure there are other alternatives too. You people know more about that than I do. Um, but um, the costs are just really getting out of control. We're going to have to figure something out that's more efficient. If, if we didn't have a high school, not only we saved $100 million plus, but think of the economies of scale, we'd be able to uh, not have to run the whole building and everything that involves. But the use of faculty more efficiently is something else that would be, um, you know, just the advantage of 
for those of us who are concerned about the costs of the operating the system. And I've been led to believe by some conversations I've had with other people that uh, some people have, uh, some kids, some children have been taken out of their school system by their parents because the courses that they wanted were offered here. Um, this one woman I'm thinking of in particular, I won't mention any names, but uh, her son was on a, a technology track and they didn't have the technology courses here that uh, Hartford or, or Levin had. One or the other, I forget just which, which one it was, but perhaps our kids might be exposed to a broader curriculum um, if we merge with one of the other larger school systems. So thank you all for at least hearing me out. Thank you. Um, I don't know how, how how feasible that proposal is, but I think it's worthy of serious study, if nothing else. So okay. thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for public comment? Yes, please. My name is Kelly Wetton. I live here in Woodstock, and I would like to, if possible, get a policy a copy of the policy as far as security at the uh, sporting events. Hmm. Do you have concerns specifically or something? Paul West did it for a number of years. When Paul West stepped down, I was voted in. I did it for a number of years. And you could call Greg Schillinger. We had a fist fight break out over there on the soccer field. I was the very first one on that field. Greg was right behind me being second. And Craig Moser was there because his boy was on the team. And he got spun around. And Craig came up behind me, not knowing who I was, spun me around, saw who I was. I said, oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. I said, yeah, you and the rest of the parents need to get off the field, leave it up to the umpires to take care of the issues between the students. And it went away. That quick and that easy. Then all of a sudden, I get told, "Why well, you're not covered?" When Robbie Bliss was still here, he made a phone call to this building and told them that I am covered under the town of Woodstock as being the town constable. Thank you. So if I can get a copy of that, I'd appreciate it. A copy of the security plan? Yeah. For, uh, for sporting events. Okay. I mean, I've done all the, we did all the high school, any event there was, it was worded back then that if there was a, any money exchanged, there had to be security here, whether it was a yo event or a dance or anything where there was going to be money from the students to a faculty member, there had to be security. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else for public comment? Uh, Lauren Lemieux. Hi, I'm Lauren Davy Lemieux. I live in Bridgewater, and um, I wanted to. Uh, after this bond vote, I wanted to express sincere appreciation for the time and effort that has gone into the new build proposal. Um, and along with a lot of other no votes that I've talked to, um, I wanted to make sure that our no was heard not as a no never, um, but that I hope you see it as a serious, genuine request for um, a plan B. Um, I, it's my firm belief that there's never just one way to do things. And um, I've heard a lot of, um, well, this is the way to do it now, <laughs> or we just pay more to do it later. And uh, I want to express. I hope that our community can come together to um, come up with something else to do. Um, and so that we're not doing it later for more money. We're doing 
something different. I would like to see more options on the table. And a lot of, uh, I'm expressing this as something I've heard a lot of the community express as well. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weisshockey. Uh, hi, thank you, John Weiss Hockey, uh, resident Killington. Just want to chime in today real quick, sort of following up on Lauren's point. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for your comment. Um, today, I received a survey uh, via Garen Schmail of Woodstock High School from the building committee uh, talking about the vote, the bond vote, how people voted, so on and so forth. And I think one critical missing question in that, which really follows back up to Lauren's point, was perhaps the first question in the survey should have been, would you like an option? Should we examine an option? Should we consider a renovation versus just a straight build? I feel as though voters have spoken and came out and expressed their feelings as it relates to the bond. Everybody wants to do something. We need to do something clearly. The question is, do we need to spend what's going to be whatever the, you know, we'll call it 99 million, although I think it's going to be a lot more than that. Or, or should we be asking the public if the resource should be focused on a renovation plan at this point, seeing how the vote on the bond was a vote down? So I would ask the building committee and any of those folks involved to perhaps send out a follow up survey asking the most pertinent question, which is really a jumping off point of, should we look at a renovation moving forward or should we only look at a build option? Thank you, Mr. Wysocki. I would say that if there was room in that survey to fill in those comments and I would hope people would do that. Uh, there, there, it wasn't a pointed question though, a very simple question of an A or a B I think would give the board better direction versus how did you vote, which I also think was kind of probably an inappropriate question. Did you vote yes or vote no? Um, I think that's why we vote in private. So again, I just feel as though the, the first step in the vote or the survey should be how, would, how should we proceed as a community, as a, as a SAU, how do we proceed um, you know, we have limited resources. Obviously, you folks are putting a tremendous amount of time into this effort, and it seems as though if the taxpayers have spoken, then we would want to follow suit for the desire of, of the majority of taxpayers. So that that's my comment, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments Ooh. from the public? Yes. I have just one more to add was that who oversees projects when they're done, when there's additions onto the school? You're just sitting right next to them. Trevor Golden. Mm -hmm. So when the senior solarium was built, who oversaw that? I did not. That's what I'm getting at is who oversaw that? I, the only reason I didn't, I wasn't here. Right. I no, no, I knew that. Years. Before me, uh, whoever was the building manager, I think it was Bruce, he would have been responsible for that. But that's what I'm saying. It should be there's more, it should be more than just one person, so that when one retires, somebody else takes over, they have a hand to them so they know where things are. And I've been told that it's underneath the same senior solarium is where this septic pipe is collapsed. You can't build on top of the septic line. And I'm not pointing that at you, Joe. Um, no, I'm, I'm just asking that question. And, and Why would we not have blueprints as a superintendent, have them here in this building or have them somewhere where we get a new superintendent? We had one before and files were kept. Did they get passed on? Where are these blueprints for all these additions and why don't we have a shop class and a woodwork working class and an automatic shop like we had when I was here? All right, thank you for those questions. Thank you. Anybody else? 
All right. I think then we will move into <clears throat> the next item on the agenda, which will be back there. Uh, the reports, starting with the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I, my first point that I wanted to share in terms of um, what we've been accomplishing in the last uh, month since our last meeting, wanted to talk about the event of February 14th when we did have a serious concern regarding the safety of the district and of the middle school, high school. Um, I want to share that I believe it was because of our strong relationships with our families and students that we were made aware of the situation. Our strong relationships with the Goodstock Police and the Windsor Sheriff's Office um, really provided us with an opportunity that we didn't want a real event to practice with, but we really were able to execute the policies that were in place uh, from board regarding safety and security, as well as testing those relationships and abilities to act quickly in response to a challenging situation. Um, I think that at the end of the day, myself, uh, Principal Smale, Principal Tancredi, uh, social emotional coach, on memory did a review of how we operated during that time, and I want to thank everyone for following the processes that we do have allowed, um, outlined in emergency operations plan, as well as the policies that have been put in place for the grub board. So um, I think those relationships were really key elements in making sure that we were able to effectively address that situation. A uh, piece of work that we've been working on for a long period of time, and we're excited that we can bring back online, it's called the Educators Institute. Uh, many years ago, we had uh, an innovation conference where we brought in speakers from all over, from all over the country, talking about topics in education. Um, part of our strategic, current strategic plan talks about sharing our expertise uh, at a local and national level. Um, we are looking at June 19th and 20th. We have approximately 10 educators who present on a variety of topics, topics including artificial intelligence, social emotional work, um, creativity, um, and we are offering that um, that event to not only teachers within our district, but teachers outside of our district. So it's an opportunity for us to really show and showcase some of the expertise of our educators um, and have others take place in that learning. All right, thank you. Any questions for Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. Um, and our next report is from uh, Raf Adamek. I'll stand over here. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. My name is Raphael Adamak. I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation. Um, and tonight, uh, I just wanted to share with you, I should revisit um, some enrollment data. So at our last board meeting, Anna raised the question about um, our, our long-term enrollment trends over time. Um, and so I just wanted, I, in the board packet, you'll see two different data sources um, that show that trend over time. And just wanted to make a couple of observations. Um, this seems like a very straightforward and easy question to answer. How many students do we have in our schools? Um, but there's a lot of nuance and subtlety and it's much more complex. Um, so the first graph that you'll see is data that is generated from um, in, inside um, uh, our school district. Um, it shows sort of a peak back around 2009. Um, and then a more recent peak a couple of years ago, um, and, and then some dips after that. It's important to note a couple pieces about this data. Um, we added public pre-Ks to our schools in 2018, so those have been folded into these numbers. Those did not exist prior to that. In 2018, um, the state changed the mechanism through which they collect all their data. So, so our data prior to 2018 um, I cannot attest to the quality of it. Um, it is what we recorded, but it was a completely different collection mechanism. Um, the other piece that's important to remember is that um, the numbers reflected here do not match our ADM numbers, which affect our finance, um, the amount of money that we get. Um, because we get money for, you may remember, we want this different waiting for different students. And we get money for students who aren't even enrolled in our schools yet. These are our private pre-K students. So in the last couple of years, we have had students attending private pre-K that we get some funding. Um, I did include the other graph that I included was from the Agency of Education. Um, I just wanted to put this out because um, this is what the Agency of Education has on their website right now. You'll notice that the, the shape of the graph is pretty similar. Um, if you 
go to the sites and, and, and come into the data points, you'll notice the numbers are very different. And so the agency of education is using really different methods to calculate this. I've been in contact with someone there and they're right now they're including students who have unenrolled during the school year in that year's calculations. So um, last year they have us at 80 more students than we ourselves had because 80 students unenrolled over the course of the summer. So um, it's just really trying to shed some light onto how these different enrollment numbers come to be. Um, the overall trend is that our enrollment is not as high as it used to be, particularly 10 years ago. Um, and we did have a peak during COVID as well, and we're going down from that peak. But um, we have similar enrollment to where we were around 2017, 2018, um, and, and that's the general pattern that we see. So I hope this answers your question and gives a little bit of context to, to some of those enrollment trends. Yeah, thanks for doing that. What? It's interesting the different rates of, you know, the fact that it sounds like prior to 2018, it's like comparing apples to oranges if we're changing weights on how much a student um, is considered and um, that the state is even changing their ways of, of counting students. So it's um, it's helpful and, and not at the same time. <laughs> right? Do you know if there's a specific reason for the reasons behind the state changing their formula or algorithm on and how it benefits them in particular because why else would they do it and does it benefit us the same way yeah that may be a question better sort of asked to the finance sort of group I, I my understanding is that i think that's what you're asking right the most recent change that occurred yeah i'm just wondering why they shifted how they view i mean as students or students the people way, way. Great form, but we're talking about people way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think Brian's uh, recognition of um, this is the the Vermont legislature. This work goes back to about 2018 when they said, you know, not every student. Um, it, it requires different levels of resources to educate uh, different students, right? Mm -hmm. And they put them in different categories. The most recent changes. Uh, have to do with um, students living in poverty, with um, English as a second language learners. Um, the weights for four-year-old pre-K students were doubled from 0.46 to one. And then the biggest change came around sparsity of school districts, recognizing that rural students, there's more transportation. And so if you're in a school district that's more spread out or you're enrolled in a small school, then those students get uh, more weight than students who are in cities or closer together where there's more efficiency. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Elliot. And I, my understanding is that this uh, was a correction of an estimate they were making. This is more empirically they based it more on empiric data that they've collected perhaps since 2018. I mean, that, so they're using their data. I think when they first did this, it was a supposition of, or estimates. Um, so, Ralph, so I understand these um, charts that you make. Is it true that? Prior to now, they were ADM, not real bodies, and subsequent to now, they'll be the, the new acronym, the five thing these, acronym, or these are bodies. These are bodies, yes. P. So, yes, so these are, um, yes, great question. So, so yes, these are students enrolled in our schools, students who, who, so yeah, and this is not an attempt to try to translate that into the to the ADM or okay. the long term. Um, just wanted to mention that, it changes based on those, those changes to the funding form. <clears throat> so this has tuition students, I think is the big change. Like when we talk about um, long-term weighted ADM, it's just in-district students, right? Versus um, this would have the, you know, the hundred or so tuition students that we got. Okay, thanks. Sure, do you want to say Yeah, anything? just to kind of build on where, so there were two groups that studied how we fund uh, education in Vermont. One was at the University of Vermont. And the other is um, Nate Levison, who came in and did our scheduling work. So he presented to us last June. And really what it identified for us, and I will confirm that, costs more in our region because we have to, out, we're not like Hartford where services are right there. And often the bigger cities, Brattleboro, Hartford, Springfield, um, Burlington, have greater access to those and greater resources. And we are always trying to create those resources and paying for them ourselves. 
And I really appreciated that, you know, that recognizes that we, we, you know, we bring resources to families. We don't expect them to drive to Hartford or Springfield. And so that brings a cost to the district. And so this new weighting algorithm really shows that, yes, you are paying for whatever support services, resources that you might have in a larger city. And that's how we've benefited. Great, thank you. Sure. I have a question for Raph. So I know um, what you said after starting of 2018, it includes pre K. So if we wanted to compare it apples to apples with historic years, we'd have to subtract the pre K population. So in 2023, it would be 915, not the thousand. Right. Correct. Right. So um, that is a pretty significant decline over time. I mean, I know we got the COVID bump. Are you seeing anything like campus by campus or maybe in like the K through eight versus nine through 12 that might show different rates of decline? Like, is this just a full district wide phenomenon of like we're losing population in every, um, every one of our towns at every age level or are we actually seeing something if we digged into the data like more kids are going to private high schools? Like, have you seen anything like that? Yeah, so we we do collect the data on students who who sort of there there are points when there's like transitions, and so we we have looked in the past at, at students who transition to to private high schools. Um, it, in the years that we looked at it, it's a very small number. Um, I haven't really looked at it much, but it appears I think it's a trend across the state across. You know the, the region. Um, I think it impacts all of our schools. I think there's anecdotal stories of when West had you know over 300 students, and um, and and yeah. So so I think it's across the board more. There certainly are kind of transition points, so there may be more. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you, Josh. So I was going to second up, and I it kind of followed what I saw for a graph that was on. That channel three ran on a couple of weeks ago was a very similar graph. It almost looked almost identical to what ours looks like on there for the statewide. So it's to me, it looks like it's the state as a whole. We're kind of following the same decline that they are seeing too. It looks pretty similar at least. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Um, uh, the director of student support services, Shana Kamitsky. Hi, I'm Shana Kalinsky, and I'm the Director of Student Support Services. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, but I also see many new faces. Um, my office is right here in Central Office, and I have um, the unique and exciting job of working with students and the educators who provide special education services, um, students who have IEPs, which are individual education programs, I also work with the MTSS team, that's multiple tiers of systems of support. Those are students who receive interventions and also students who are on uh, work with an educational support team, that's what we call our EST plan, and students who are on a 504 plan who might have another type of disability. All of these interventions and specialized instruction and accommodations are all designed to help students uh, access their education on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, have successful outcomes here in school. I get to work with a resourceful, creative, and flexible team of occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech pathologists, special educators, paraeducators, school psychologists, nurses, and our counselors across all of our buildings. And we work with the principals and the educators in those buildings. Um, one of the things that is pretty amazing we're talking about enrollment and for special education in the last year we've actually tripled the number of students who have tuitioned into our district because of the reputation of the special education department and the students continue to come at the beginning of the year in the middle of the year and that makes that team that resourceful team very valuable because the budget's already done and an IEP, you can't wait until next year to fund what's in a student's IEP. So they're constantly flexing and responding to the needs of the students on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and they're a great team to work with. And I welcome you to contact me uh, at any time if you ever have any questions. Uh, and again, my office is right here in this building. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you, Shana. Any questions for Shana? All right, thank you very much. And from uh, the Director of, of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Jen Stanton. Hi, everyone. Jen Stanton, uh, soon to be Jennifer Settle. So if you see that email or name, um, just so you know, that's me. Um, I wanted to start with saying that I am sort of the person that works with Shana with all students. I work at the universal level. So curriculum, instruction, and assessment for all students. And Shana works with tier two and tier three students, the students with intervention needs and special education needs. And so we work together collaboratively frequently to serve all students. My office is in the high school and middle school. I've been in the high school and middle school for 15 years. I was a science teacher and department chair before I became the director of curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, at the very top of my report is a link for you. Anytime you have questions about curriculum, you can go there first, the SE website. You can also send me an email if someone interacts with you uh, in your town and has a specific question, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can answer them as best as I can. I want to speak to two pieces that have been happening over the past month. Uh, first was our in-service day, which happened last Monday. We had teachers working with Julie Brown, uh, grades 5 through 12 on literacy. We had teachers uh, pre-K to 4 working with Patty Kelly on math. We had teachers um, doing letters training, which is a training that everybody did last year. 70 plus hours worth of literacy training happened for te teachers that hadn't experienced it yet. We had nurses um, working to focus on student supports uh, in our craft program with Out and About, also engaging in some really robust professional <laughs> development to make that program strong. Um, when it comes to literacy, something that is very exciting that I just wanted to speak to is the words gotten out about our program here um, and how we've developed it. And uh, Sherry, Julie, and I presented to the Indiana Department of Education about how we used teacher voices and, and teachers' experiences to really build our program. Uh, and so we're becoming a model for other states. So I just wanted to share that with you. Time. Yes, I don't know if this should go to you or Shana, but I'm hearing some mumblings about a pilot test for um, how to include parents in early readers, and uh, I personally am excited about that and wanted to thank the two of you and, and Julie Brown for, for spearheading that because I've reached out to ask for support and it turns out that the support's already on its way, so thank you all. Yes, we are going to also have some additional pieces on our report card, elementary report card next year, so families can access those at any time as well. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right. Anyone else have a question for Jen? All right. Thank you very much. Um, the Director of Finance and Operations, Jim Fenn. Good evening, all. Jim Fenn. Um, briefly, I pay your bills, take care of your budget, make sure we have money. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, the rest of it's all flow. Um, I spent a lot of time working with Ben over the last year on the new build committee, Ben and that team, and uh, we'll keep working at it and get it done. Um, one of the things that I brought, I'm bringing this evening, and if you have the um, agenda you saw, Joe and I have been working with Visbit, who is our School Board of Vermont, School Board Insurance Trust, um, and actually kind of disappointed and disillusioned with the way they've serviced our account. Mm -hmm. And last year, um, after telling us for six months we were going to have a 7% increase in the uh, premium, they offered us a 23.9% increase, which I screamed and carried on about and got it down to a 15.5%, but I put it out the bid. And uh, we're working with Red Sea Church Agency out of Massachusetts. They do about 8% of the independent schools in New England. Um, I used them in uh, Fall Mountain, where I came from, uh, very successfully using McCartigan Mountain School. And again, I've reached out to them. They put together a package for next year for us that's $9,000 less than our current package. And that's the max, and we're still negotiating. Um, it equals or exceeds our current coverage. And so I'm looking for you. This is significant enough decision. I want you to make, sh make sure that you're on board. We'll no longer be with one insurance company. We'll be one insurance agency. But, you know, workers' comp will be through MEMIC. Something might be through Liberty Mutual. They're putting it out to their group of carriers that they use. And leveraging one against the other to get a good price. 
So um, that's one of the things that Joe and I've been working on, and we'd like to put that in effect on July 1st. We should probably clarify, we're not talking about employee health insurance, right? We're not talking about employee health insurance. That, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of choice in because the state has told us we're got to go with them. So how big of a budget line item are we talking about for this insurance? Um, $253,000. Okay. Thank you. Um, is the two hundred and fifty three thousand dollars the fifteen point four increase that we were going to be paying? No. Uh, how did the percentage numbers the, jive the, with the the fifty? The two hundred fifty three thousand is nine thousand dollars less than we're paying this year. So is that number the fifteen point four percent increase, or not with the fifteen percent increase? That's, that's what we're paying today. That's what we're. We're, we're paying $260,000 today. And we're going to pay two fifty two dollars next year. I think what Bob is asking, when did the 15.4 hit? This year? Or July 1st, this past July 1st. <laughs> so we had to take that one. We, we took that. We budgeted right. settled. We're we had to pay 260. That was the 15.4% increase. Yeah, now over to 2026, we'll drop to the. We'll drop to 252. You're missing a number. I don't know what we're so I budgeted about 240 for this year, Bob. It costs us 260. Got it. Next year will cost us 251. Now there it is. Next year will cost us 252. I budgeted almost 270 because I had to budget still thinking about this. Okay. Go for it, sure. Is that is that clear? It does. Okay. Uh, I'm sort of at a loss as to whether we should make a motion so that we can discuss this. Or can we continue discussing without the motion on the table? Mm -hmm. it's, we're discussing a report, so I think we're okay to talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for those of us that don't know the details of this, a higher level question. So it's not health insurance. What insurance coverage is this involving? If you open the insurance proposal that is in your um, document, it's property, it's automobile, it's general liability, it's violent event response, educator legal liability, excess liability, crime, cyber, workers comp, um, and flood insurance. And so theoretically, thank you for, for answering that. And I've, I've opened it up and was gonna read it out loud. So thank you for reading it uh, for me. Um, um, My brain just took a pause. That's okay. Well, I'll ask questions. Sure. Uh, so I assume that it's apples to apples, like the coverage limits are the same or uh, very, very close. The coverage yeah. limits are the same or better. Same or better. Thank you. Was there anything specific or is this just across the board? They're raising the rates or is it nothing specific about our district that like our history or anything that would make it like our cyber thing that I, I think. I think that they all reacted to a couple of claims that we had. Okay. Um, if you remember, we had a water pipe freeze at West. It cost us $45,000 last year. And um, we've had a couple um, workers comp claims that they they put huge reserves that ended up being insignificant claims. And so I think they overreacted to some of these things because they didn't have the right people in place to, to react correctly. Okay. So do we know where the savings were? Like I'm looking at the thing, I see the green on the workers' compensation. But that's that's is that just, the only place that we saved, or is it was there like savings in every category all the way down through? I don't get a breakdown like this from okay. this bit. Oh, okay. okay. I get a lump sum and then I get workers' comp. Okay. Okay. So I don't have the site break. The savings is the mimic wanted it, so they took their price and they gave us a discount on top of that. Oh, that's what you're seeing there. I was just curious on how the breakdown was in comparison. Uh, right. So for me, wherever we were paying because of our claims and stuff is why the rate has gone up or increased. I know you talked about down to the 15%, but that when they added that 15%, that's what made the people you want to switch to able to save us 8,000. So were those guys already that much more expensive than what we had and what our claims have been brought us to that level? No, or I, what makes it comparable? Because that's after the fifteen. I, I think floods, snow, other things, and Vista only covers Vermont. Liberty Mutual covers the whole country. 
So they have the ability to absorb a regional district uh, issue that visit doesn't have. Okay. And so I think that's part of it. I think that they switched actuarials, actuarialists. And so they recalculated some numbers. So I think it's a multiple things that um, I'm sure some of it was because of our claims, because our claims were about 75% of premium and they like to see them around 60% of premium, but it wasn't our claims exclusively. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, this bit um, comes with uh, a lot of opportunities for grants yep. and other services, such as the PATH program for yep. your employees. Have you looked into the value of those and losing access to those might impact the budget? The PATH is through behind, and so we're, that remains. And $10,000 is savings is easily, easily equal to the grants we get. So I'm not concerned about those. If you have ever experienced uh, the team from uh, Fritzy Church, they have three school safety officers in their office. They come out and they do workplace uh, ergonomics. They do all the same things. They have a larger staff that covers New Hampshire and Vermont than Bisbet has. So um, they offer some of the services. That's one of the reasons I went with them instead of somebody else. Because they're they're in the business of, it, of insuring schools. Yes, sir. So you said you've used these you use these in your path, you use this company in your I've used this like, agency once before. Okay. So Target, what was the other one? Ball Mountain? Ball Mountain Regional okay. okay. School District. So Cardigan, I know is a private yeah. school. I don't know about Ball Mountain. Ball Mountain's a public school a public in New Hampshire. Okay. So when they were your public school, because that's the apple to apple, so yeah. Cardigan's kind of hard. Um how was the like how does coverage how did what did you see as a administrator from your uh, teachers and your administration staff, like in comparison to what they had before. Today. The teachers have no interaction at all with this group of insurance unless they have a workers' right. comp. No, that, yeah. And I have found my experience, and we're going with Memic on workers' comp. Memic is like the Cadillac of workers' comp insurance companies, as far as I'm concerned. They have one of the best teams I've ever worked with. Uh, when I was at Fall Mount, we were with Liberty Mutual. I struggled with them a little bit. I switched to uh, Memic the next year, and uh, they're just top shelf. I can't tell you enough great things about dealing with Memic. They're supportive, they're responsive, they do what they're, they need to do for two reasons. One, they want to keep the claim down, but two, they want to make sure that we're doing our job so that we don't get the second claim. Okay. I have a point of order. Yes. Do if we want to approve this, do we even need to? Do we need a motion or just um, tell them informally to carry on, get the best price? By when do you need a decision? I would like to. Um, I have a notice that I have to give to um, Bisbet pretty promptly. So okay. So you want something tonight? So I'd like something tonight. I don't care if you vote on it or you just you know by a. You know, group say yes, please move forward, and I will. Um, officially, I I want you to be aware that I'm doing this before I do it. Yeah, it feels like it's within your discretion. I mean, we all had a chance to voice our concerns. Mm -hmm. Jeff? So I, I was going to say the same thing. The only thing I would ask is that you continue to try to negotiate at lower. Well, you have the next, well, you have the time to do so. Between I've, now and I've worked with yeah. Devin before. I will keep working on that. <laughs> Does anyone on the board have any concerns about Jim uh, making this change? All right, Jim. I, I, I just have one question is, are these introductory rates that they're going to really raise up in the next two years? I mean, he, he knows better than we do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. You know, the good is that. And the only other thing I wanted to share with you, uh, because I think it's more and more important each time we, we meet, is since I did the report in December, we've received another $67,692 in grants and gifts Ooh. that have nothing to do with the new bill. So we're just shy of $400,000 on those things this year. And, um, you know, we don't talk about that enough, you know, and in a $30 million budget, that may not be a lot, but that does a lot of the extras that you don't pay for that are not part of uh, the tax impact. So I just want to make sure that we keep talking about that. Thank you, Jim. I think we have um, agreement that you should move forward. And anyone else, anyone who comes up with another question is welcome to email Jim. You don't have to do it. 
Great. Thanks for all that you do. All right. Thank you. All right. We have two student uh, board members. Uh, we have Aiden um, Kiovella on the screen and Owen Corsi here in person. So um, I welcome you to give your reports. Um, yeah, I'll go for it. So um, hi, new people. I'm Owen Corsi. I'm a junior at the high school. Um, I run across country. I'm on student council and I do this. I'm a student um, rep here. So a couple things. Um, the high school's craft program, which is like our agriculture focused program, um, is, well, this is a little outdated. It just finished um, a exchange in Bavaria, Germany. So they were doing a cool agriculture life sciences focused um, trip over there. And then we're going to host, I think, five or six German students here next week. So that's really cool. I've always thought that's a great program. Janice Bobel and Abby Castriano do an amazing job. Um, and this is just another example of that. Um, I think a lot of students, to be honest, were, were somewhat disappointed with the results of Tuesday's bond vote. Um, but I think people stay positive and um, are always grateful to Joe and the entire Buildings and Grounds team for working so hard to uh, keep us <laughs> running over there. Um, and then the superintendent student advisory group is organizing with, which is a, a group that works with um, the SUSA on various issues, but uh, also organizes this summit every year in the fall. So they're working, um, we're working with student leadership clubs from so far four other high schools in the area um and so uh we're going to coordinate with them and, and have them involved with an event in the fall and it's been great to see sophomore and freshman members underclassmen um really stepping up to plate or to bat um and uh doing good work there so that's it on the screen Can you all right all right, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I'm Aiden. I'm also a junior and a student representative on the board. Um, like to be outside. I'm a ski instructor, mountain bike instructor. Uh, I am part of that, uh, the superintendent's student advisory council that one was just talking about. And um, yeah, I've been going here since um, to the, uh, the middle school and high school since I was in seventh grade. Um, my report's kind of going to be a little brief, kind of following up behind what uh, Owen was talking about. I think that uh, crunch time is upon us for students as they get ready for AP exams and SATs coming up. AP exams are in May and then SATs are in Mar on March 20th. Um, the school facilitates um, those tests then. Um, on a look, so students are really getting re ready for that, preparing with them. Um, I know um, Heather Veneta and um, uh, Miss uh, Sullivan Justice are kind of leading, leading a um, SAT prep course that students are part of. So students are getting ready for that exam coming up. Um, winter sports have come to a close um, in the past few weeks with a lot of uh, sports teams going toward um, participating in statewide competitions. Um, congratulations to the boys varsity Nordic team for winning the state championship title. And also, most, just recently, the girls snowboarding team, uh, the varsity team, just won the state title as well for the second time in a row, I believe, um, if I have my facts right. So congratulations to both teams. Mm -hmm. um, with the closing of winter sports, spring sports are right around the corner with teams um, uh, participating in captain's practices and also um, preparing for the season ahead. And we're excited to see what our spring sports season has to offer. Um, uh, congratulations to Agnes Kardashian and first alternate William Obard, who um, won the uh, our um, kind of uh, regional Woodstock Poetry Out Loud contest, contest, which was held, um, organized by English teacher Martha Perkins and held on February 16th, which was a Friday. Um, the audience really um, were captivated and engaged in the uh, performances of um, students who performed their poems. And um, uh, we wish the best of luck to uh, Agnes Tart Kardashian, the winner, as she heads up to the um, regional competition. Um, and the I'm also the head, um, kind of the take, taking the lead here with the Code of Conduct Working Group. And we've been um, doing a lot of good work with that. Currently, we are getting input from students, educators, teachers, and administrators about the um, what current rights and responsibilities they believe they have and what rights and responsibilities they want to have in the future and think they should have. Um, 
and our hopes is we will um, kind of work through this information and synthesize it, kind of have it the heart of our new document. Um, and uh, yeah, exciting work coming in the future. And um, yeah, that's my that's my report. Thank you. Any questions for Owen or Eden? Well, thank you. You always give us some good insights that we need to know. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, all right. We are going to, at this time, what we're going to do is uh, have a time for each board member who wishes to speak about the annual uh, the the annual meeting and so forth and the the bond vote. What I would what I would like to ask is that we do not ask questions of who's ever speaking. We just listen to what you might be hearing in your communities, as some have already expressed here in public comment, or you know, if you have suggestions on directions we should be moving in as we move forward. I think um, whatever we do next, we really need more participation from the full board in your own communities. And um, as we embark upon uh, a new plan, uh, we would like to hear from each person who wishes to speak. So <laughs> you want to go over the results of the voting? I sure. Like so then do you want to go ahead and do that? Sure, I can put those up. I just think I just need someone to make me a presenter. Okay. That's okay. As he's pulling that up, I'll just say that um, Ben and I have continued meeting together with a few other folks, and um, we have um, constructed the letter that went out to all of the communities and to you uh, regarding um, our thoughts at, after the bond vote results came in, as well as the budget vote. And we also uh, worked with a team to put together a brief um, survey to gather as much information as we can. It was very clear to be said to be specific. Tell us whatever you want us to know. It is anonymous unless you choose to make it not anonymous. So whether you say yes or no, it's up to you to choose that you want people to know that. And um, you know, that also offers you opportunities to get involved if you wish to or to receive further information. So that is in the process of going out. Sam is actually going to be sharing that with um, the listservs, the forums, and all of those things tonight. The principals have put it in their newsletters. Some of those have already gone out, not all of them. The staff and the board has received that, um, that survey as well. So that being said, go ahead, Ben. Sure. What's on the screen now, and I apologize, this is kind of small, I'll blow it up here, but I've taken the two budget articles. Um, one, the, the top line is from last year, and the uh, article six is the, the budget item from this year. And what I want to point out here uh, is really to make a point about um, voter turnout, right? As you can see, and I've got some, um, some kind of numbers on the bottom where we crunch this, but voter turnout this year was absolutely massive. And I want to, um, uh, and then this uh, next line is the the bond itself and the voting results. And again, I'm going to crunch some numbers here on the uh, the bond results. But the um, the first item, let's see, is the uh, the budget results itself. And I think we, we should take a pause here. And I'm going to switch my screen here um, to go over to a news item um, that ran in on BPR uh, five days ago. And as anyone's kind of followed uh, budget news around the state, I mean, we are incredibly fortunate to have the community support that we have in the school district. I mean, to come out of, uh, to look around the state and see that a third of school, our, our peers um, are, you know, not over the hump. Uh, 10 school districts have delayed their budgets in addition to these that have already failed. So to get the kind of community support that we have, um, to have a 60% support of our school budget is absolutely phenomenal in this this year. It really goes to show the level of commitment that our that our communities have to our students, to our educators, and to uh, letting the people who who work uh, for us do their do their job. Um, and just to kind of uh, break that down, you can see um, at the town level here the the votes on the budget itself, and we had. The budget pass in five of the seven towns and um, by, by pretty wide margin in four of those towns, right? Barnard, you see it passes the, the margin is 25%, uh, Pomfret 55%, Reading 21%, Woodstock 41%. And 
Uh, Plymouth, it eked out 1% there, right? And then you see that it, uh, Bridgewater is a fairly close vote, uh, 20 vote margin uh, in Bridgewater. And then um, Killington, um, you know, had a, had a much larger um, margin of voting the budget down this year. Um, so to kind of, um, then the next thing I want to cover is the, the bond vote. And you can see the numbers here. And I've let me just uh, zoom out so you can see what this is in reference to. So this line is obviously the votes for, against, um, blank, got a surprising number of votes on both of these, uh, both items, the budget and the bond. And the total voter turnout, um, you know, uh, really massive on these items. So the margin of defeat of the bond was 340 votes out of a total of over 3,500. So you're talking about a margin of less than 10%, uh, and that comes out to 45% uh, for, 54 against, and 1% you know, uh, blank there. Uh, the next thing I wanted to um, focus on was voter turnout. Uh, this is kind of where we started, um, and that's, um, you can see that I got a line here for FY24 uh, and FY25. Starting with Barnard, a 328% increase, going from 83 voters to 355, right? Mm -hmm. um, Bridgewater, 186% increase, right? That's almost triple for those, um, you know, yeah. doing the percentages. Um, Killington was interesting. Killington, um, they typically have very high voter turnout. Last year, they were the, as you can see from the slide here, the highest voting um, in, or sorry, the second highest in raw numbers. Looks like Woodstock out, outvoted Killington by just a little bit, but um, kind of at peak voting already in Killington, it looks like. So they only went up by about 10%, but everybody else at least double, if not triple, the, the voter turnout. You want to add Reddings, that's the highest we've ever had for mm -hmm. voter turnout in our town. 301. Ever. Oh, that's interesting. And you guys were the champions in terms of the percentage. Looks like you had 59% voter turnout. I mean, uh, when Stowe's um, uh, bond failed in, I think it was it in uh, in the fall of this last year, maybe early winter, they had something like 18% voter turnout, right? So just to see the level of engagement of our of our communities is really, really cool. Um, that people care about this stuff and that the work we do is important to a lot of people. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to, to show here um, was um, just in, since the, the bond vote is kind of the talk of all of our towns, I wanted to provide the board with some perspective of other bond votes going back about five years uh, in Vermont. And you know, to, to, for us to come in at you know 45% voter approval our first time out of the blocks is, is pretty significant for a, a district, of, you know, a combined district of, of seven towns. Um, you can see Winooski back in 2019, I talk about that project a lot. They're a single town school district, but they were able, to, they got their, their budget, their, uh, their bond vote passed it's a pretty you know small number of voters, but uh, by 28 votes, right? So a 4% uh, difference to get their uh, $60 million renovation back in 2019. South Burlington, nowhere near as fortunate. 2020, they tried to take a, uh, sorry, that's not a, uh, a, a trillion dollar bond. That's a, that's a $210 million um, new build project to their voters and it got crushed 21% to 79, right? Um, then Slate Valley didn't even publish numbers in that, that same year. They said it just failed by a large margin, right? So who, who knows? That was a $60 million renovation. Harwood in 2021, $59 million renovation. They got about 25% of the vote uh, for that. That was tough times. That was during the pandemic. Um, I think that played significantly. The next one I wanted to show was an interesting story. Uh, Fairfax, Bellows Falls, they've had their share of troubles. Um, they went to bond four times. In uh, 2017, they went to their voters with a, a renovation project. It got voted down. They tried again in 2019, got voted down again, uh, and they took some scope out. I think there was an auditorium that they pulled out of the scope, and they were able to get their um, the, the bond approved by 11 votes. Right now, that was that was so close that. Um, the, um, the, there was a kind of a, an opposition that happened to that in the town. They said, look, we, one more time, right? And so it came back. And I think the criticism was that the, the school board was not as uh, transparent as they could have been. There was some, um, some mail out, some uh, ballots that got mailed out. But anyway, they came back uh, the next year and uh, got it passed by a, pre, uh, a fairly comfortable margin in terms of you know, how these things go, 66 votes, right? And then Burlington, as we all know, passed um, their um, 
uh, you know, they're $165 million, at least when it went to bond. I think it's at like $205 million now, uh, 76 to 24. And Stowe, the one I just talked about, you know, didn't um, come anywhere near as close, 36 to 64. So just some perspective of other, other bond votes around the state um, that have hit the news recently. And um, I guess I just wanted to kind of give everybody the information. And again, um, thank anybody who may be listening uh, for the incredible participation and the uh, support of our annual school budget, which is really appreciated. Could you go, could you go back up to the very first charts or could you email this? Or yeah, sure. Why don't I give it to Raina and we'll put it in the minutes. And tell us again what these two charts so These are the actual budget articles from the last two years. Last two years. Yep. So article it was last year was article two. We had about $26 million budget. And you can see that was a 50 uh excuse me, 68 percent. Um, not the same kind of economic times. You might remember from our budget discussions last year that we were keeping the tax rate flat, right? So you still had the CLA that was um in play, but this year there was far more. I think, um, you know, attention and, and um, um, you know, at Plymouth, for instance, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing their, their um, increase to their um, to taxes go up by about 30% this year, Woodstock 25%, right? This is significant headwinds to be able to pass a budget. It's the reason that we're seeing a third of them fail around the state. So, sorry, did I answer your question? Yes, sure did. Okay, Thanks. question. Yeah. Um, so for the statute to um, say that the bond vote has to be commingled, I mean, is there a reason for that? Sure. Let me pull that up. Um, well, I don't have to show you the statute, but that's essentially what it says. Um, in the weeks leading up to the uh, the vote, Rena was just kind of reviewing the statute and the applicable procedures and um, coordinated with our uh, school district uh, attorney and confirmed that, yes, in fact, for uh, a, a union school district, with several towns that um, the um, ballots are to be commingled before they are counted, right? So uh, we do not have uh, numbers for the town level. Well, I'm just curious as to the, to the rationale. I mean, do we know? I, I haven't looked into the legislative history. I can, I think we can all guess. I mean, but. And that was back in June of 2022, I think we're going to say. We don't know exactly. That's like yeah. the latest change to that law. Oh, okay. um, but if you look at the other, like looking at the other laws, like, um, you know, like other matters that unified school districts can um, can decide on your articles of incorporation, uh, you can have town level results if, if that's what um, your articles say. And I think ours probably do. Uh, but when it comes to bond votes, those have to be coming. <laughs> Probably to protect from, you know, pointing out certain towns and saying if only you people over in that town had voted mm -hmm. in directions, probably because we we were all, as we know, pushed into the merge and some people really, you know, across the whole state. There were many towns that did not want to do that, but did it. Yeah. So I think they were probably trying to protect from that kind of them us type of thing. You see, I mean, we could we could get just as angry about you know yeah. the budget, I suppose. I mean, that's the only thing I'd say in in response right. to that. Right. You know, but uh, I mean, I don't know if we want to unpack this. This is if anybody wants to make, and I can pass this, send this around. But you know, with the the margins that you're seeing mm -hmm. here in, in Barnard, Pomfret, Reading, Woodstock, you know, I um, and then the the relatively low margin by which the the bond failed, three forty. It, it seems likely, we don't know, who knows, there could be something really erratic, but it seems likely that the bond probably passed in a majority of our towns, right? And that if this were uh, an electoral college presidential election, you know, we'd be done. But it's not. We have our, our rules and, and this is the, the system that we're in. All right. So at this time, I invite board members who would like to speak about um, anything that's on their mind regarding the vote. Any suggestions to consider, as well as what you might have been hearing from uh, constituents in your towns uh, as we forge ahead into uh, making uh, next steps? Uh, Brian. Yeah, I'll go first if that's all right. <laughs> um, I would implore the board to, and first of all, Ben, to the group that's been working on this for all the years, it's been in progress. It, it's wonderful. The amount of work you guys do on it is incredible. Uh, with that said, what I'm hearing a lot from, I represent Bridgewater, but I talk to a lot of folks regardless, is uh, a lot of the people that voted no against it did that based off the taxes and the impact on their wallets. And 
for a lot of the people in my community, they didn't see the benefits to the increase in tax. Um, a majority of them below the poverty line or less income than uh, the average in this district, their kids aren't going to go to college. They're not going to afford it. They wonder why we don't offer trades. We look long term at schools. The best way, in my opinion, to keep enrollment is to give the kids that go here, like myself, a trade that will allow them to stay here. And then their kids will be here. That's why I'm here. I'm third or fourth generation go through the school. Uh, and through my family's property, I'm allowed to still live here. Uh, financially, there's no other option in any of these towns for me to live in other than it works out for me through my family. I'm okay with increased taxes if it benefits me and my family down the road. I support the community even if it's not a direct benefit to myself, but we live in a community and district that has a serious shortage as does the entire area around us with trees. So a thought of mine that would, although it, <laughs> adding a trade or a tech center to a bill will not decrease the price. It will add value to the to the folks that can't afford the academia and the college options. Um, and we could it give us an opportunity as a board and, you know, to engage more with our community. There's plenty of local businesses that would love to help support stuff like that as possible. Um, we could offer courses. I, I talked to Chief Green and he was he said he could give a rundown of a pilot of a firefighter one EMT course, which is something that you could test out for once you're 18. But you could take that trade to any state. Every state needs it. So even if you want to go to college, I, I think the trade doesn't affect anybody coming to Woodstock for the academic purposes. It just gives options to the kids that aren't going that route a better chance at being successful after school. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, I see Corinne and then Sam and then Ann. And then the rest of you get a chance. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I want to just, it wasn't what I was going to say, but put a bunch of underlines under what Ryan just said. I, I think that's um, something I've been thinking about for years and sort of heard about and always wondered sort of what the opportunities were at the middle school, high school. But um, to the extent that uh, we might be looking at tweaking a design, um, yeah, I think that would be amazing to look at those opportunities there. Um, what I was going to say, though, is um, a couple of things. Um, the folks that I have talked to or have, you know, communicated with me about their no vote or have, have been, you know, similar to, um, you know, some of the folks we heard in public comment where, uh, it, it seems like there, there is not a confidence in, you know, the plan that was put forward that it was, not too fancy or not too big. I mean, that wasn't exactly what those comments, the public comments were, but, but um, I think in, as we move forward, um, one aspect of um, the sort of information, um, the, the communications needs to be, I think, uh, directed specifically at, at those questions. Um, and and at the same time, this you know more sort of information. Again, this is it's a long history, you know, leading up to where we where we were last week with the vote in terms of you know the board um, and community conversations around our options, um, and the information sessions that I went to or other gatherings where it was discussed. I mean, I think when folks had a chance to ask questions about, you know the renovation option, for example, there was a chance to have those conversations and to sort of understand, you know, get to an understanding that like financially it do that doesn't, you know, most say that that, that doesn't make sense. It's going to cost us, you know, almost as much and we don't get much out of it. Um, 
but if you haven't been a part of the conversation, it's, it's hard to get, it's, it's hard for people to understand that that, um, I guess either a, re a renovation or sort of a different design has been explored enough to be a real option on the table. You know, and I think that's what people are saying. Well, I want to sort of see options. You know, we were we were given we were given a lot of information about this one option that as a board we, you know, we judged was the best way to go. Um, you know, over over the years, but not everybody had all that information, and so what they got was one option. Of course, that's what a bond vote is, right? You're voting on, <laughs> you know, this is you know, a certain amount of money for, for this option that we're giving to you. You're not, you can't choose A, B, and C, you know, <laughs> when you're going to bond. But in terms of um, moving forward, uh, more, maybe more engagement around what is the reality of those options. And one thing I wondered was, um, you know, some people say are saying like, well, couldn't it be, you know, we want a new school, but does it really have to be, you know, 99 million? I don't, uh, you know, an open question to me is what would it cost, you know, for, um, mm -hmm. I don't know the reality of this, whether they'd want to do it, but, you know, for example, our current architects to oh. do a real, you know, low budget uh low cost sketch of what what could we do to pare this down you know obviously it takes a long time and a lot of money to sort of do a thorough design but what could we do what would we have to cut out right to come up with something that was say 75 million or 80 million you know it's still a new school what are the realities of you know the sort of trade offs that we would have to make as a district because one of the things that, um, you know, Bryce would say is, look, um, if we look at redesigning the building, trying to cut it down, we're looking at cutting programming. So fleshing out, you know, some of the details of that might just give people a little better context um, as to sort of what the range of choices might be. Um, and finally, I just wanted to ask the question of, uh, you know, how soon, you know, timeline, how soon, if if we decide as a board, we want to bring this back to a vote or bring something else to a vote. Well, I guess the question is, if we wanted to bring this back to a vote, the same bond, is there a sort of, uh, you know, we have to wait 60 days, we have to wait six months or whatever. And um the secondary question is, uh, is there any time in which if we felt confident and it's the way we wanted to go, we could bring this back and still be on the same timeline for building as we we had been, um, assuming the the choice to support the bond, you know, flipped in, in the reboot? Do you want to answer that question? No. no, I don't think you should answer. Thank you, Corinne. Um, in the interest of time, let's try to try to uh, not repeat things that have been said unless you mention it briefly um, and try to keep to maybe a two minute because there are 19 of us. <laughs> uh, Sam. Uh, hi, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, uh, also would like to underline some of the things that Ryan said about uh, tech options um, coming from a, a parent of a student who could really uh, I enjoy those and uh, Hartford Tech is waitlisting most people applying these days. Um, so just saying that, um, I think one of the things that, you know, I think doesn't get discussed enough um, is the amount of um, conversation that needs to be done on the state level. Um, I really think it was great that in Carrie's letter that was talked about, um, but, you know, right now, what I feel like is that we all need to be petitioning our state representatives and mm -hmm. senators 
to reignite the the you know funding for new builds and things like because if they if that funding still existed as it mm -hmm. you know, used to, um, I think that that the, a bond for the amount that would have needed been needed plus the state funding um, would have passed. You know, I think it's it's crazy. It's I hear a lot of oh our taxes are going up, but then we're not getting any financial help from the state for this new build, you know, and I think, especially as a giving town from Act 60, you know, um, what we really need to be doing is getting state representatives in these meetings and really getting our state representatives to be fighting for this. Because at this point, I, I've been heard from more than one town, uh, town person that that it's really they need the state needs to step up with financially and we shouldn't uh be putting a bond to um to the entire taxpayers um there was a meeting over the summer not summer uh early fall where state res representatives came and spoke to locals and local business owners and they, um, we sat in the library. We had this meeting, certain people from the community were invited and I was invited as a business owner. And, um, you know, to ask about how the flood was affecting our community. And uh, I couldn't help it, but put on my school board hat. Um, and I said, you know, I'm, I know this is not why you get folks are here, but, Honestly, you know, if you really want to think about things to help our community, you're currently sitting in one of the one of the second worst rated built schools in Vermont, and we need a new school. And we're have a community that's hurting from floods, you know. And I, I just said that, and I, and they were like, "Oh yeah, well we'll consider that." Of course, I mean, of course, but I I really do feel that that is what I've heard from a lot of people is you know, um. Where are our state representatives fighting for this money? Um, yeah, so that's my two cents. Thanks, Ann. Hi there. Um, first, want to just underscore thank you so much to everyone who's put in a tremendous amount of work to get us to this point. Um, I want to say, as a representative from Killington, as we already discussed, uh, the votes are commingled. But just looking at the budget vote, I think we have an indication of how the town of Killington probably voted. And so I just want to say that I'm really looking forward to engaging more with folks in my town to really understand and listen and hear what their concerns are, bring them back to this group, make sure that people's concerns feel answered and uh, that they feel really brought along in the process, because I think that's a lot of what people are saying is that they, you know, joined the conversation maybe late in the game, but at the same time didn't felt sufficiently brought along. So I'm really excited in the next you know, year or whatever the time period is to uh, really listen to the folks of Killington and, and bring those concerns to this group. So thanks. Thank you. Anybody, um, you can just sort of go around the table if you want and pass so you can come back to Elliot, anything you'd like to say? I just think it's important to have as many listening events as possible. And to hear perspectives from people because I think there are some things that we're not thinking of and to hear the impact of, of this and I mean something we haven't talked about is like we try to put this in terms of you know what your taxes are going to go up for a year but in some people this is like a major investment that they would be doing over a period of oh. over a period of you know 30 years and that's <laughs> something that maybe all of us don't appreciate. So I think hearing from a lot of different people would probably be, and you've already, that in the survey, and you've, you've thought about those things, but I think listening events and having more of them and no judgment at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these are not gonna be well thought out or spoken. Um, I certainly did not put as much into this as other people have. And even still, I was I was pretty dismayed um, we've heard the students were dismayed, the, the, the teachers were pretty dismayed as well. Um, I love that we're doing what we normally do. Um, our leadership has done such a great job of turning this around and being like, okay, we've heard what the voters say, you know, there's still some concerns, let's open it up to everybody, not only the board, not only the students, not only the staff, 
um, but the full community. And I just implore that the folks in the community that did vote no, we want to hear what you have to say. We need you to step up. We need all these ideas to come out. I also agree that trades tech would be an amazing add to this. I know uh, at least one student who's looking to actually go out of district for trades and tech. Mm -hmm. um, I have some ideas spinning in my head that I would love to, to bring to the table for that. Um, uh, uh, again, from my first responder hat, we had a, a, a credible threat within the past month. Our current campus is not set up for clearance of hot and warm zones. Um, I don't think that we could get this current ca campus up to speed if we had a campus that was built for modern day threats. Um, uh, the ability to clear that campus quickly and safely would be so um, effective for keeping our students safe currently and also being able to get them back into the building quickly and safely um, that our current campus is just deplorable because it was built in a time when we didn't have bombs and guns and everything else coming yeah. into our to our student spaces. So um, cheers again to our leadership for for being so open and and leading us so well because I was uh, pretty frustrated that night and then the next day we had an email that said all right we're going to start taking in comments and not only again from from us but from the whole community and I think that's so applaudable. So thank you for leading us in the way that you do. Thank you. Ben, are you going to pass? Uh, I mean, people have kind of heard a lot from me. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll just say that um, I'm uh, just in, in the feedback that I've heard so far, one commitment um, that I'll take is um, it's we need to be one thing I'm incredibly proud of that we did through this process was transparency, right? Was being as open and as communicative with our um, communities as possible. And I think we should absolutely continue to do that. Um, but the thing that I want to take is to be as clear as possible on the financials, right? And that's always been my goal, but you can never do enough on this stuff, right? Um, and the, the one thing I would say that's a little bit of regret is that we started this as a board more than a year ago by passing the tax impact cap policy. That got completely lost in all of the, the cycle, right? No one was paying attention to the fact that we had committed to cutting the tax impact in half, right? Just out of the blocks. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a whiner, but at the same time, it's like that feels significant, and we can do a better job of communicating. Thank you, Adam. Um, I, mean, I, I I'm not to put an overly positive spin on it, but I think it's incredibly encouraging the, the voter turnout that we had, you know, in this year. I think particularly coming from Reading to see that amount of voters turn out to vote. Um, this is what a democracy is, right? People um, come to a vote and have their opportunity to express themselves. I think, you know, the challenge um, with a, a venture like this is that this conversation has been happening since, what, 2016. Getting um, volunteer buy-in in a, um, a state where our population is low is incredibly hard, right? We can look at all of our first responder departments that are volunteer, volunteering to be on a school board. Um, we don't get people's final voices until a vote, essentially, right? Um, I'm, I'm really proud of the effort that our, our committees did leading up to this to really be transparent and do informational setting sessions and get out and communicate this. So it is a bit frustrating that despite all that, there's still comments that where people are, you know, this is, you know, that this is it and this is all you're going to, you're giving us just this final product. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, continuing to do what we're doing is with this is a conversation that needs to continue and it's not going to go away. Um, and that we the, the dialogue continues. Right. And I think the more dialogue, the better. Um, and I, I'll be open to how we can further that dialogue, you know, outside of board meetings in ways that feel productive um, and are limited in terms of the feedback will bias and that you're, you clearly want it to be this. Rather, that um, there's opportunity for people to dialogue to dialogue about it. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, um, I'd like to emphasize the fact that I think there are a lot of people who think that no is not an expensive choice. No is still an expensive choice. Like I don't think people understood. Okay, so to carry this bond will cost about five million a year, and to keep what we have will cost about four point eight. 
Like, I think that information is, is not clear. And so they think no is, is the affordable vote. Like that's not an expensive vote, but no is still expensive. And the other thing is, I think there's a perception that this is a lot of money for something vanilla, like just a high school. I love what you said about tech and that several other people caught on to. The idea in Vermont that it's tech or college is really outdated. Some of the best high schools in the nation, High Tech High and Bergen County Academies, they do tech and academics in one building. So if we can market more things like craft, craft is brilliant, right? It's right here, it's an academy program, or you can take it the tech route. And so I think if you could, could show people how expensive it is to vote no, and you can put some pizzazz on what you're offering more than just a building to go to school in, but a building where you could like do tech and college together and hear some really beautiful programs, I think you could move enough people. Thank you. Brian, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, one of my further thoughts on the vote text and stuff is um if you plan to have down the road to save money for the taxpayers if there were certain renovations <laughs> or projects that could be done by our woodworking shop under the proper supervision you know a school built for the kids by the kids type idea where when we you know three years from now we can see with the influx of students that we're now attracting with our new school and everything else that we're going to need another science room I don't see why our woodworking shop would not be able to plan that and that year the class build the woodworking shop. You know, and it'll help tie into the community because for the next 50 years, when we drive by, they're like, damn, I built that sign. <laughs> uh, my dad talks about planting the trees in the 80s. So I know that. Uh, but yeah, I already spoke. So thank you. Can I just ask not a, a, a question? Are are tech programs regionally funded or Thank state funded? You. I so just wanted to be clear about so that. So that's what I was looking up while I'm at the fence. So we are not able to offer a tech program by statute. We had to become part of a regional tech center and it understands how the grants work in order to get the money. They had the state of Vermont determined probably 20 years ago mm -hmm. that we would combine all the money to offer regional tech centers. There are 15 of them across the state. And so all the money and grants available to tech centers are for our region goes to Hartford. So that's why we no longer have the, the garage and the wood market because we are not able to offer that level of program. We have to buy in. We're part of the Hartford Collaborative. So we, we had a woodworking shop that left because of lack of enrollment by students. We're not signing up for those classes. Um, but in terms of becoming a tech center because of Vermont statute, we cannot do that. So can we do any of that in a club setting? Right. And and the reason why that is, is it's so expensive. And I think Ben showed us a slide of the cost to over offer those programs, as well as to find teachers who are certified in those areas are so extremely challenging. I know that's Hartford's challenge has been finding licensed teachers in the tech areas. They can make so much more money yeah. if they're actually out in the field. But the cost of all the work, I know we went through that with the new Lou lab having the right air system, having the right supervision, having, a, I mean, the amount of regulations around a more tech-centered classroom that compared to a traditional classroom, it, the costs are so much higher. Mm -hmm. But I just, thank you for that clarification. And we really cannot offer competition to Harvard Tech Center by statute. So, right, the most you can do is a few programs. Right. Like, you know, like yeah. craft is a great right. example. That's a great way of, addressing our community needs in a more hands-on way, but in terms of building a gym. I was just going to say, um, we do have um, a program, our C3, which allows students to access internships and experiences in local businesses. Um, so we're trying to come up with creative ways to still allow students to access that. And we do offer bus rides to and from Hartford twice a day for our students so that they can access the Hartford program. Um, but we can also get more creative, so keep those ideas flowing. But right, we've had kids apprentice at, at Shackleton's. We've had students apprentice at different, um, uh, you know, at the um, equates a sugar hanging program. We've mm -hmm. offered different ways, in addition to Hartford, to pursue different kinds of careers. Um, I so, think I but, technically um, did an apprenticeship for Mrs. Worrell as a class. 
um, if I think back on that in my senior year. Um, quick follow-up question, Sherry. Um, so if we are, aren't by stature able to offer tech classes within um, Woodstock and ha have to put funding towards Hartford, does Hartford then have to take a certain number of students from each school district that then is paying into the Hartford Tech? Like, do they have to be, okay, well, you know, what's the, this school district pays this much, so we need to accept this percentage of students, or is it, is there anything like that? Yes, there is. And, you know, okay. I'm on the Hartford Tech Center board, and proportionally, uh, Woodstock has been pretty well represented there. We've right. always had students, we've used our, and in fact, we've taken some numbers from other towns. So there are students. So, and I'm going to look into the concern around waitlisting. I've not heard that. I know students always apply, have a first choice and a second choice. I think 95% of the time, my understanding is when we send about 15 juniors and 15 seniors, everyone that, that is appropriate for the program, and there's certain definitions, yeah. receives at least their second choice, has been my experience, if not okay. their first. And there's some programs, you know, like building trades, which again, the numbers, and it's competitive, but there's always a second choice. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And I just, I'm sorry to be a second. Oh, Sammy, Sammy, quite an order. <laughs> Can you follow up at the end, Sam? Yeah. Uh, no, it, it was my, my hand was raised to speak again on the bond vote. Um, yes. I, yes. After everyone has had a first chance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Bernie? It's 831 and I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Josh? <laughs> so, as, as someone who is openly opposed to the bond, oh, really? <laughs> I'm surprised, right? It, it, part of it comes down to oh, there's not very many kids that I graduated that still live here. And that's not just a trend for my class, that's a trend for every class going forward. There are not many kids that I know that were Woodstock graduates that still live in Woodstock. Partially, affordability. Can't afford it. It is what it is. We all know that that's an issue. That issue is only going to be ex extra bleh, be made worse. We can't even say the word right now. So made worse by adding this bond because you're now going to increase taxes again, which is going to increase profit values, which is going to increase, you know, mm. the, the whole spectrum goes in correlation with each other. You're, you're taking it and making it harder for people to stay here. So that's why, you know, Ryan's idea with the tech center was, and I know we can't take by statute do one, but that would be a great movement because now you're going to offer, hey, you may not want to go to college. You may want to be an electrician, but you can step out and we can have a partnership with, you know, whatever, Shaw Electric, for example, and they're going to go, hey, we're going to let you go through and work underneath us. You have a job. Now you have a reason to stay here. You're not going out into the open world going, well, I'm 18 and I don't want to go to college. Now what do I do? And here in a lot of them, it's leave. And that's that's a problem that I've been against. And that's partially why I'm saying until we figure that problem out, the problem, you know, we're never going to fix the school issue here. Like the building would be built, but there'd be no longevity, no sustainability. The other part to the to it comes as we as a, as, a, as a society, we are declining in Vermont. Like you saw the map earlier, student populations are declining. The we have an aging population in the state, so that's kind of hard, a hard sell to say we're going to spend this kind of money on a declining population of students. We also have a state ed fund that's not funded well. That's a state problem, and the state does not have any skin in the game. So, as I've talked to Ben about with and Sherry. And Harry and Sherry and everybody on the board about is we we're, we're asking these people to put out ninety nine million dollars without a guarantee that the school will outlast the forty year bond. We don't know that the state ed fund says we got to make cuts, and based on statute, we have three schools that in our area that are already tech centers, so they're not going to shut those guys down. And I mean, I know our goal is to be a hub. But until the state has some skin in the game with that 30% uh, commitment to pay some of this, there's no guarantee from the state. And that's 
kind of been my my opposition. And I think we can work hard to force the state to make that commitment. Now we have something to go back to our board voters and say the state is committed to us. Thank you. Uh, John? Uh, I don't know that I have much to add to what's already been said by others other than um, underscoring finding ways to uh, creative ways to uh, disclose the, the value proposition for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Katie? I have nothing to add, um, just that I uh, I second everything that Ann Carl said from our from our little corner of the district, um, but nothing else to add. Thank you. Laura? Um, first, I'd like to shout out Marlena and the fundraisers and all of the funds that they've been able to raise without having the community say, yes, we're going to do this. Um, and I hope that people they might be able to raise funds from in the coming year will understand the long view um, and not say, oh, well, it's it's done and, and you know, that's it. We're not going to pledge any more money, but hopefully they'll see the same things that Ben was presenting about how, you know, this is kind of how it goes um, and continue to be able to raise funds. And I just, I'm just so amazed. I, I've heard some people say, oh, well, the amount that's been raised is nothing compared to what they're asking taxpayers for, but also considering she, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, she works part-time, and she's only been at it for a year, <laughs> you know, so this is, I, I thought that was pretty impressive. So I wanted to shout that out. Um, and then the second thing is any, uh, any no vote that I have heard the reason behind <clears throat> has never been no, because we don't want a high school in our town anymore. You know, uh, I think everybody, yes and no, still wants to have a high school here. I, um, I would hate to see sort of an education desert happening in the middle of our state if our high school fails and we start tuitioning our students out. Um, I live way up the mountain in Bridgewater and I can't imagine how long my student would have to be on a bus to get anywhere else. So uh, I'm really committed to them being able to go to high school. Um, and I think that we can all start with that common ground and go from there. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah. Try not to repeat anything others have said. I have some notes that are not in a particular order, but um, I first just want to thank everyone who has worked so tirelessly on this behind the scenes for many, many years, um, eight years for some folks. Um, and so I, it's just so impressive to see what, what you all pulled off and what, what we pulled off in terms of just the engagement and the transparency and the work we've done with the um, the architects. Um, and I think some of the positives are that the public is truly engaged and the numbers have shown that. Um, there seems to be consensus that we need to do something and it needs to be done soon. I think one of our challenges is that, you know, we really needed that momentum four years ago when, when we were coming off the design of the new build. Instead, we were interrupted by the pandemic. And one of the things I think that um, that did through this process is it may have made some people feel as if the design was sort of being handed to them because they weren't part of the process. Um, because we ran that process almost, you know, from 2016 to 2019 when we when we did all the work to engage the public on the design of the building. Um, so I, I think the message, and I think you guys have already sent this to some of the members of the public, because we want to hear everyone's feedback on how to proceed. We want to hear about what changes and improvements we can we can make. I, I just heard one very last minute that um, they, they thought it was absurd that we would put special ed on the second floor. And I had not heard that before. Um, but that, you know, you've got kids who've got to get up to the second floor who are in special ed who may need hand, you know, handicapped accessibility. Um, that was one that came in from a constituent. Um, I think we just want to take you know, everybody's different opinions into account um, and hear what their proposals are, um, appeal to different parts of the electorate to get them excited about the vision versus feeling like they're being handed something or given something um, to them on high. Um, you know, I think if we can address the enrollment issues head on and, and pre present a building um, that is viable with or without the growth, um, 
clearly, if, I think if we brought this back to the voters next mm -hmm. week and the state was bringing 30% match or something, I think it would have passed. So I think if we need to prioritize where we put our time, it's 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 nudging the state. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think having the kids' voices come in towards the end was really, really helpful. And I think we could even do more of that. Um, my daughter's here at the high school. In one day, four of her classrooms were shut down. And four, four classes were disrupted. Um, she's in AP language, and they couldn't use half the class because the heating pipes burst and there was water on the floor. So it's it's actually impacting education right now. Kids who are supposed to be learning curriculum for their AP test are not because they're moving around and sweeping up and mopping a floor during class just to find space to to conduct the class. And so I think even a picture a day of what the kids are experiencing would, would send a thousand words. Um, I, I went to the girls' senior night basketball game and the, the girls went to get changed in the locker room and the, the locker room had flooded and they couldn't use it on senior night. So there's just, there's just things that the public aren't really hearing about. The kid who was recovering from an accident and had to be use a wheelchair for the first time and, the, and they, they tried to use the, the elevator at the building and got stuck because the elevator broke. I mean, these are horrible, you know, things that are happening that people should hear about. Um, and then I think just talking up the positives of our school to bring out more community support. You know, when you start hearing people suggest that we close our schools and send them to other regions, I, I think what's lacking is the fact that we are a unique, incredible pro school. We have more APs offered than a lot of schools. We're placing kids at really, really, really good colleges. 75% um, of our kids participate in sports. And, and a lot of that would would be gone. I mean, if we if we sent half the kids to Rutland or Hartford, you would not have the same uh, opportunities. So I'll end with that. I could keep going. I know that was more than two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Keep going. Keep um, my experience was intense disappointment. That most people that I talked to were intensely disappointed um, because of the no vote. 24 hours later, maybe 48 hours later, I felt a lot of positivity and momentum. I've heard some people who voted no, who I know voted no, um, want to help out, want to like get involved and call, you know, their state rep and write letters and get and maybe help out with some of these working groups. I think maybe so, I heard this from somebody, but um, listening to Matt, it made me think maybe some of these listening um, work groups or listening events could take place in the locker room. Could <laughs> take, <laughs> take place in some of our the classrooms that the kids mm -hmm. sit in. All day, you know, five days a week for how many, you know how many hours of their lives. Um, but I also want to say that the school is the heart of the community, and it's really, really important that we keep our kids here, mm -hmm. keep them here, and give them the environment that they deserve to have. Yeah. Thank you, Lydia. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob. Yeah, I have two things. First, I don't think there's a chance that most of the people that voted no voted no for any other reason than cost. And maybe there was one or two said they voted no because special ed was on the second floor, but I don't think that's the case. I think it was cost. I was a little disappointed that the, the survey, the four question survey went out so fast without any input. And I think we should add to it or send another survey out that asks a simple question. If you voted no, what number would it take to change your no vote to a yes? Mm -hmm. And I'd even not just throw it out there, just say 90, 80, 70, stop at 70, 90, 80 or 70 million dollars. Okay. That said, there's no way you're going to change the design and cut 25% out of the school. There's just not. Even just the cost of redesign would cost a, a ton, which means there's only one other option. 
two actually, more funding. We've talked about the state. That's a hard nut to crack. I have no clue how we do that, and it'll take time. The other is gifting. And while we've done some jobs so far on it, I don't think it's nearly enough. I think this community has enough history and wealth, and even the surrounding towns, if you add in all the people who have bought second homes in the last five years, there has got to be a way to take the answer. Let's say the vote flips at 80 million. That if you counted up the people that answered the survey and say, my vote would go yes if it was 80 million or 70 million, whatever it is, at least that gives us a target. And then go out there and fundraise and talk to the state and say, the school is not happening unless we get this much money. Because you're not going to do it any other way. Thank you. Is that two minutes? Um, I wanted to give Owen and Aiden a chance. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Matt put it pretty well. That's as good as a perspective as you're going to get. Um, there's there's endless examples of this. Like I was in my pre-calculus classroom the other day, and the average temperature they had uh, measured throughout the day was 94 degrees mm -hmm. because the heating was completely out of whack. Uh, so that was pretty brutal. And then our land classroom was uh, half submerged and reaped of blue. Um, so there's weird things that happen every day that I think if we inform the community, they might understand more. And it's good to, you know, as we have been, but it's good to remain sensitive to these are extremely high costs and 16% or whatever it ends up being, uh, it's harder when there's, when you're earning less or when there's less to go around. So it's good to be aware of that. Um, but I think it's a worthy investment. If I could vote, I would vote yes, but um, yeah. That's just one Aiden, would you want to add anything? Oh, there it is, yeah. No. Aiden? Oh, it becomes that. Ask him again. Um, okay, Elliot. I, I just want to make another comment about talking about the state. I mean, maybe the state. I know they're talking about sort of redoing the whole formula, which may actually turn out to be worse. But in, in any event, okay, the whole idea of um, dividing by the CLA is just is just a horror, and, and especially how it'll. There's no cap on what the difference can be from one year to another, and that's the thing that's really. I mean, again, the school budget, the school budget passed, but went up by six percent, but limits to thirty percent when you start dividing by the CLA, and it's just. That's unfathomable. And it, it's got to be smoother. It's got to somehow have some sort of cap. And, our, and that has to go back to the legislator. It has really nothing to do with our local. Um, Josh. And look, I, I just wanted to tell you, say that Ben and Bob, like, I appreciate your point. It was 100% on the point with what I, my issue was with the, with the to begin with is right now, you look at our district and I, I've kind of traveled kind of Ben about this is that our non homestead rate, it is cheaper to be a non homestead than it is to be a homestead. That is completely messed up. It, that it is broken and it needs to be that. That's one of the things that need to be fixed. It should not be cheaper to own a second home in a town than it is to be a resident of a town. That it's just is crazy to me. And I think that's at the heart of the entire issue. That would be one thing that would fix. And if we could put some of that weight onto them somehow, whether it's the state, whether it's some initiative that we decide we come up with here, I don't know how that's possible, but maybe. But something where we can lessen the impact on the, the homestead. And whether that be on the non homestead or whether that be on the state, like something fundamentally has to change in order for. That to work and like you said I, I think the idea is if you said is it step 90 80 70 and you figured out a way to lessen the impact you would have chances of having this pass with flying colors but on the current model okay thank you is there anybody on zoom that wants to make another comment another comment uh yeah uh, just to add on to something Lydia said, um, I think it would also be great if we had a listening session at a sporting event. Um, one of the comments that came out at the Bridgewater informational meeting 
was, um, you know, people talk about the school being the heart of the community, but it, you know, is it like I am embarrassed to say I'm on the school board. I've never been to any sporting events. Um, I know in my defense, even when I was in high school, I never went to any sporting events. <laughs> But I have played the theater several times, so you know it's a thing. But um, <laughs> and then several people raised the point, you know, that they went to this high school and they were on a team and they just didn't feel the community support them there. And maybe something we could do as a board is try to, as a board, go to sporting events and and try to boost community spirit. I just pronounced the word wrong. Um. Uh, Tom, you will have a chance to speak at public comment time, which will be hopefully not too far. <laughs> Sam, did you want to say anything further? No, um, Matt covered what I should have waited and let everyone speak. So yeah, Matt covered a lot of what I wanted to say. So thank you. Okay. So um, I guess I'll sum it up because I don't just say too much because I'm supposed to be impartial, but I will say, I want to say this. I said, of all the people who worked on this and put mega hours into it, I don't think anyone put more time into it than Ben. Mm -hmm. Ben was the front man. Front person at every, every event. Um, he uh, made the numbers uh, understandable. He um, mostly kept his cool and um, <laughs> under some great provocation at certain meetings. And um, he really um, has gone far, far beyond where I think all of us have gone. It, it's been a lot of work, it's been a lot of time. Um, my granddaughter said, Oh, do you have a meeting tonight? And I said, Yes, I do have a meeting. She goes, she always have a meeting and I said it's true I go out a lot um but I think that as we move forward I was disappointed of course like everybody but when I looked at the actual numbers and saw that it was a 340 dollar uh, 340 <laughs> vote um oh, with 3500 voters I didn't feel as bad as I did once I saw that and I thought you know there are things we can do on our side. We can look at a lot of these ideas here. We can go back to the board and, you know, sort of triage them. We'll take in the information from the surveys um, and hopefully people will answer it and not just say, oh, they don't listen to me. We wanna hear from everybody. We'll go out into the communities and we'll do what we need to do to see how we can move forward with a new school. Because no matter what, I am convicted that there is no way renovation is an option on a building that's been determined to be 97% depleted. So the only option is to get a different building. And so I put it in the newspaper and I'll say it here, I'm committed to the next three years to do and work as hard as I can as I go into my retirement in June um, to, um, to see that, we, that our community gets what they deserve. My children went through the school. It wasn't great then, and that was in the early 2000s. So um, I don't think it was ever very good when I started in 1980. Uh, so let's move forward and keep the positivity and address the realities. And um, you know, we'll be working hard to get information out to all the board members of things you can share in your communities and information we may want you to gather and opportunities to find places to have listening sessions or whatever we end up naming that to just sit and listen and, and uh, take it in and then call it some more and see what we come back with. So thank you all for the honesty, the perspectives and your thoughts. Uh, it's a wide range of things to take into consideration. Thank you all. Here, here. All right, I think we will keep moving forward here. Here, here. here. It's the uh, committee reports, finance committee. Yes, uh, I think we're good um, for now. Great, <laughs> awesome. Policy committee. Yeah, so we have two uh, policies for first reading. I just want to briefly talk about both of them. So the wellness policy is a redo from what we had. And just to put this in perspective, this is actually a big deal policy. It covers a lot. Um, 
it covers basically everything about nutrition, about physical education, it's guidance on health education. <clears throat> and uh, it's a big deal from that point of view. It's also a big deal because of the implementation. There's got to be uh, sort of mandated is to have reporting every year and, a, and, a, and a, an assessment of every, uh, every three years. So the new policy is um, been written in conjunction with the uh, Vermont uh, School Board Association and the Agency of Education. And it's put together as basically, there's actually a 28 page gu um, uh, local guide of how you have to put the policy together. Um, and it's put together as uh, statutes and then how you have to have a language for it. So that's what this represents. The difference between this and the policy that we have is instead of having like an addendum or an appendix with all the different um, ingredients or, or statutes, it's actually put in as part of the thing and there are, there are hyperlinks to them. And they're important because you have to follow like exactly what they say in terms of education. Um, uh, in terms of what's included in, in every part of it. So it's put in and it's structured that way. And also <laughs> all the parts about uh, about administrating it. So with that, I would like to pass it on to the board for uh, as a first read um, and for uh, second read next time. Okay. And this, but by the way, this has gone through, uh, the, there is a part of it is there, there's a part of it, School health team, and it's been passed on to them, and one of the representatives has, has looked it over as well. Okay, thank you. And did you want to talk about the fiscal management and financial accountability policy? Yes. So, and that one is also mandated as uh, just as an update um, to our policy. Um, I did send it on to Jim Fenn, who reviewed it, and he actually. Uh, looked it over and changed a few things. And actually there was a separate report, uh, a separate policy uh, F21, which is on reporting. And he decided that it was better to sort of incorporate into one and he liked the reporting we used to have. So now it's all in one policy F20, so. Okay, thank you. Yep, so I would like both of these sent on uh, for, uh, as a first read today for a second read next time. We need a motion on that, yes. We need a motion for both. Is there a motion to move those two policies forward to a second reading? So moved. Second. Okay. Ross and John, thank you. John and Josh, I should say in that order. Great. Um, all in favor of that? Discuss with this. Oh, sure. Um, I just noted something caught my eye. It said the recommended physical activity per day is 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And like Vermont Department of Health has guidelines for K through five of 30 minutes, but six through 12, 45 minutes. So theirs is 225 a week versus the 150. And and so, and what, what actually got me looking yeah. into it is I thought there were also federal guidelines on required amount of, um, of physical ed for kids. So I would just say this, like check for consistency with federal law and with whatever. I know it was written by the Vermont School Board Association, right. so you'd think that they pulled the state okay. recommendations, but I happened to see something that said 225 minutes, 225 minutes a week, six through 12. So the Vermont state stand, uh, educational quality standards only require 30 minutes daily for elementary, there is no expectation at the state level in terms of um, middle school and high school in terms of activity. Um, so it would be looking at federal recommendations. There are no federal law about that. There are recommendations. And that's what I found too, was a recommendation, even in the Vermont Department of Health for 45 mm -hmm. minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the way we wrote it was just to capture the minimum required. And it even said internal and outside of class. So that, that made it sound like you could not do 30 minutes a day because the kids could do their 30 minutes at home. Because the, the paragraph says inside or outside of school. Mm -hmm. It also says, it includes recess and, and uh, movement built into the curriculum. Stretch or whatever. They're probably including texting as part of Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just say consider looking at that paragraph versus all the other recommendations federally mm -hmm. and state. I think Alyssa Smith could help you with that. Yeah. Okay. 
So I was just going to say, I, I I mean, we can always be more strict than the state. We can't be more lenient. So maybe we can pass on to something as far as maybe we can kind of push an initiative there. Um, just something to look at on your end, Elliot. I don't know yep. those resources you got, but. Um, yes. And it's my understanding that we're compelled to have other school based activities to promote student wellness. We can't leave it blank. However, our health program exceeds federal mandates. So you can put in, like, you can repeat yourself that we're going to teach health. But if you leave it blank, you're not compliant with what we're compelled to do. Okay. We can add that for the second reading. <laughs> All right, um, yes. proceeds and grounds. Oh, did you want to get the vote? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes, we have to vote. Um, all in favor of uh, moving those to the second meeting with revisions, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Buildings and grounds. Um, we we did not meet. Um, but I, we will meet this month. We did not meet in February. We, we will meet in March. Um, but it's just becoming increasingly apparent that JCI is not performing under their contract. So the, the system to control the heat in all of the buildings in which they've worked was supposed to be delivered, I believe, August of 2022. Correct. And we still do not have a way to control temperature in our buildings, and, and they're not performing under the contract. So. I think we're going to look at every um, option we have, um, for, you know, every re all, any recourse we can take. And that will be part of the executive session. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just go back to see if you can vote on that for me. Just definitely. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought I said both of them. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Wrap up. Thank you. Cool. Get out. Right. Get it out. Okay. All right. Uh, working groups. Any working groups have an update? Yeah. We covered your bill. We're going to have to see this is meeting tomorrow. That's mm -hmm. yes. What's the right? Yes, it's coming. Oh, okay. I thought yeah, it was it's coming yeah, after the week of cool. the minutes. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next okay. thing on here are the minutes from February second as well as February fifth. Did anybody have any corrections to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, um, would somebody make a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and, and now we're going to put in the uh, adjustment from the uh, agenda. Josh is going to tell us what's what he's got. So I have a resignation letter from the emergency uh, operations coordinator, Mark Duncan, mm -hmm. that I'd like to Pass a couple of copies if anybody wants to read it out loud. They're only welcome to because I don't. Typically, read resignation letters out loud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just usually read them and then we can make a motion to approve. Yeah. Is this the emergency coordinator? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> and so I have not read it. It's good to be today. I didn't even talk to you. Yeah. I read the first, like, who it was, what it was. She showed me, he signed it. I was like, okay.
think there's anybody else around the table that's done with theirs, if you could send it this way. Yeah, just let everybody have a chance to read it. Yeah. The online has a chance. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Well, we would make these meetings be already I wanted. <laughs> Is there a, a motion to accept the resignation? So much. <laughs> Second. Okay. okay. Are we ready to vote? I guess my quick question I ask for accepting. I don't, I'm just kind of lost. I'm curious as more to why we just approved this or hired him less than a year ago, I believe. So I'd be more concerned on why a quick turnaround and more importantly for the process of getting a new emergency coordinator that we're up to date with state immunities and all that, which I imagine we probably are, just in the limbo period of not having an emergency coordinator, if we still have everything set in uh, order in case there is an emergency of any sort at our schools. I'm going to defer to let Sherry say what she can say. And say. Well, thank you for a good question. It was a one year contract, it was a one year grant. So this was out of ESSER money and that time is up. So it started in March of last year and was scheduled to end in March of this year. Thank you. And we're looking into uh, Jen's exploring opportunities through Title IV to fund it. Um, and, and what um, I know with principals and discuss what needs they have to continue the work we do. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the resignation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we do have another opportunity for public comment. I see that uh, Mr. Wysocki would like to say something, so you can go ahead. No. Yes. Hi, thank you for the time. Um, I just wanted to follow up on um, the comments that I had heard from various board members as it relates to the perception of the reason for the no vote. Um, I can't speak for everybody. I can't speak for all of Killington for sure, but I do have a strong sense of the community. Um, I run the design review board here in town, so I have a sense of the Act 250 process and the permitting process. It didn't appear as though the timeline was a realistic timeline. Uh, the timeline would definitely impact costs, and those would be challenges. So I think that was one issue that, you know, was on the table. I think secondly, 
as it relates to overall cost, I think the folks in Killington feel as though we spend a tremendous amount of money per pupil uh, in oh. educational expense. And I understand this is a state issue. And so many people spoke about state funding. And, and I think there's a lot of agreement here that the state is an issue. Um, I think we calculated that we're currently sending about $132,000 to the state per pupil in the town of Killington to educate our children. State average for educational expense per pupil, I believe is around $32,000 as far as, you know, if you, if you dig into the budget and divide it by the number of students. So, you know, clearly, and I don't know what the number is in Woodstock. Does anybody have a sense of what that number is in Woodstock per pupil that you're sending to the state? Yeah, we, We're no yeah, we don't usually comment in public comment. Okay, that's fine. So, you know, it, it just feels on this end that we, you know, and again, I understand this is not a necessarily a local issue, but I think this is part of the voting issue, is that we send a tremendous amount of money to the state as it relates to education, and that's only going to increase a lot when we, you know, have our CLA adjustment happen in the next year and a half or so. So, Things are going to rapidly change here as it relates to individuals' property taxes. Um, people's property taxes are going to, you know, go high, both at the state level, you know, just from our adjustments to CLA, but also then, you know, if we further it with a bond issue. So I think those are serious challenges that you faced in the vote. Um, and no offense to, um, and I'm sorry, I do not know um, your chair's name, so I apologize, but when you say and make a comment publicly that in no way, shape, or form that you'll accept or present a renovation option. I'm not sure that the communities at large and the voters at large and the taxpayers look at that as a board that's actually coming forward with good options to get to a resolution to the problem. There is a serious problem. We all know we need to address it. But by saying that renovation is absolutely not something that you're willing to propose and you'll fight for and it, you'll fight against and so forth, I just do not think is necessarily positive. So I'll end it with encouraging you to include a very basic question in your next survey that says, would you prefer or like to see an option for renovation versus new construction? Thank you. Uh, Sam? Um, I have a public comment tonight. Um, oh, yeah, oh boy. Uh, so I, as uh, speaking from public comment, um, I've had a few, um, locals in, uh, Woodstock come to me and to discuss issues regarding the drop-off pickup at Woodstock Elementary, which I know we've spoken about many times in the past. Um, I, you know, would like a public comment to bring it up again. Um, you know, uh, I, I will say somebody who lives in the village, I do drive past pretty frequently watching people, uh, drop, you know, parking along the green to, um, get their kids to school on time. And, you know, there's harried moms with, like, uh, toddlers trying, like, you know, they're trying to wrangle them across Route 4 and their kids and their school-age kids trying to get them all there for drop-off. And, it, you know, I think it's it's really good to just take one, you know, uh, kid not wanting to hold their mom's hand crossing the street of Route 4, you know, with all the amount of groups um, that could really be an issue. Um, not to mention the fact that they're getting parking tickets for having to park there, which I also think is a whole nother issue that is not school board related, but town related. Um, but I, I do think there should could be more conversation um, regarding a uh, drop-off pickup line, like, a, you know, a real and actually organized one. And, you know, getting the town um, involved in maybe um, getting some of the police officers there every morning 
to um, to officiate a drop off pickup line where really it's not just people, you know, there's that space in front of the school. It's supposed to be, you know, just drop off, pick up, don't park, but people do. And, you know, something a little bit more organized where it really is like, you know, you're driving up, you're dropping off your kids, you keep on moving, you know, you're not even getting out of your car. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add that to public comment tonight, and I look forward to talking about it more. Thank you. Uh, Tom Giacomo. Tom, are you there? Muted. there. We can't hear you, Tom, if you're talking. There. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I just one thing I wanted to say, maybe to conclude. Um, I had the pleasure of going to a one-room schoolhouse in Barnard and um, going to Woodstock Union High School. Terrifying experience, by the way. Um, and having the pleasure of teaching there. Uh, I do have a slight, if it's a complaint, it's very slight, that I'm very, very interested in design concepts and I've been doing it for 30 years of my life. Um, I would like to know where the exact corner is by the auditorium entrance, it says 1968, um, in relationship to the new build. And secondly, I'd like to know, I have not had a good experience with communication with the architect or the architectural firm. Um, the final plan change was, I believe, the end of January, and the vote came up in early March, and I had just gotten the recent, if, if you had sent out some form of larger uh, format for the final, final plan, not April, but in January, um, I'd find out that the, uh, the, some of this is petty, but you have a beautiful new design for a library. I think that the one that you have right now is quite nice. Um, but the library didn't have any kind of curtain shield. Uh, that was one of the questions I had asked. And the library vista is looking out on the uh, sports arena and the parking lot. Um, I, I, I wonder why you really want to have open windows. And on the other side, which was touted to be one of the most beautiful parts of the whole concept of the winged central motif, was that you had um, this beautiful maker space with a large vista of the river. Um, and due to cost constraints, um, it has now become a conference room, a faculty lounge, and a student lounge. Um, I, I think we need to have at some point an understanding of the value in 2024 dollars of uh, Mr. Rockefeller's donation on the auditorium, number one, and Rhoda Teagers, Teagle's uh, donation on the um, library. Uh, you also already have a gymnasium and yet you have a lot of wellness spaces in the new construct. And I think that talking with the architect might be a good idea for some, if you use the word renovation, uh, I, I understand I've seen enough of the rusty pipes. Um, I think the entire 1958 school can go very easily. I wouldn't miss it a bit, um, but I do see the idea of a gymnasium, a existing gymnasium, and some of the uh, entry space and the office space um, and the library and some of the other areas in the art room. Um, can This can be 
looked at for the future, you might be able to think in terms of daycare or after school programs or something. It's a it's a 50 something year old building. Um, I, I can see it disappearing at the end of the cafeteria completely all the way down. No classrooms, no cafeteria, no old building. But I, I sort of, maybe it's just an emotional historic response, but the Yo Auditorium um, has got some problems, but it's still a nice auditorium. Uh, even if you had to separate the buildings, um, would in asking the architect, would that be something that's viable? Is that viable for daycare? Is that um, viable for after school programs? Uh, what would the cost be to take one third of that uh, area that you're talking about demolishing and utilizing it in conjunction with the new build? Uh, I, I just think that we have, to have a little bit more discussion about these items. Uh, before, Sorry, Tom. Totally we abandoned. thank you for that, and you'll have plenty of opportunities in the I next so. uh, weeks. Okay. I do. We'll, yeah, I do hope we'll, so. We'll, look, we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, Jerry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bad penny back. Um, I can look and um, the informational meeting. I applaud that, you know, to talk to people about why they voted no or what their concerns are. I think that's important. The other thing is the state is us. So even if it's $30 million from the state, we're paying for that too. So, but I, I'm very interested and in willing to put in some time. I've got lots of folders that I've created in the last several months. <laughs> so I, I think we need to see a bigger plan so that we can really see what all of the, for the new bill. I had trouble seeing what the different labels were so okay. maybe a bigger plan for us folks who see <laughs> issues. All right. Well thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right. Um I think we are done with our, our public time and we need to uh, go into executive session. I'm gonna propose that we take a vote to go into executive session and then take a few minutes. <laughs> Get them up and get them back and get water. I make a motion to go to executive session at 9 25. Oh, yeah, and we're recording. All right, there was no action taken in executive session, and now we have an opportunity to reflect. Anybody would like to offer one or two things that can be added to the minutes? I just wanted to assure Heather and Arnie, and I gave Anne the same assurance last year at this meeting. They don't all go this long. We promise. Yes, they do. They go yeah. long, they go longer. <laughs> I'm Jordan. Depends on the season. Yes, well, I think even though we had some serious big things to talk about it it really helps if we adhere to the two minute thing sure. more i think next time we'll have a timer so many people plus the public we want them to that's all i think they recommend three minutes but mm -hmm. um but if you tell don't them. say what you need to say in two minutes <laughs> It probably doesn't need to be said. Mm -hmm. I was happy to see how many members of the public joined us on Zoom and, and in person. Usually not that many. Should or try to pass it on to every meeting. <laughs> uh, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll continue to say thanks to everybody for working on this team together. We've got some really awesome minds around the table and appreciate everybody stepping up the, for the committees as well. That was really impressive. Yes. All right, are we ready for a motion to adjust? Yes, so, hey, Ryan, I think we can set, set first. I'll second. In the time of second. Good night. Great right. job, everyone.